Okay. Do you think we I, need to have a structure to this okay. podcast? Otherwise, I'm going to make fun of your bangs the whole time. Are you serious? You're going through something. Oh, and we're I mean, talk obviously. About it. <laughs> I've said that, but they do look good. So you're also dressed like, like John Lovitz hair. today. What's going on? <laughs> What's happening? I bought this shirt before I did mushrooms, and then after I did them, I got the confidence to wear it. Like, did you get this at a Sandals Resort gift shop? What's I happening? I kid you not, mm-hmm. I was getting dressed this morning, and I was like, I have to wear something that Whitney can ridicule. Otherwise, she will feel jilted <laughs> and will never ask me to be on the podcast again. I actually made her wear this. I was like, wear a funny shirt so I can roast you. Yeah, you did. Material. You look like you're trying to look 15. Okay, I mean, let's just break this down, you guys. I really, I because I, I like to, you know, at the beginning of podcast, release all my insecurities so that they're yours. Oh, is that what so you So you guys have to deal with I don't them? listen to this <laughs> podcast. Not uh, a fan. I skipped the first part where it's mostly you talking. Okay, so I, um, nice try. Cute, very cute. Um, I've FaceTimed you before and you were in my merch. So let's just <laughs> calm down, Taylor. Um, it was free. I'm... <laughs> So <laughs> I don't like you. I'm just thrifty. <laughs> I'm wearing a hat again today because I have something called a swollen salivary gland and it makes me look like I went to Joan Rivers surgeon and I'm insecure about it. People already think that I get a facelift once a week. Right. Because uh, I finally learned how to contour and I can afford good skincare. Yeah. I'm always shiny as fuck. So everybody thinks that I'm like just, you know, gone off the rails like full housewife. And so I'm wearing a hat, a burgundy hat to cover it up. So I'm not trying to look young. I'm trying to look less like Carrot Top. Okay. And it's making me look more like Carrot Top, oddly. <laughs> I'm Carrot Bottom. <laughs> so I am wearing a hat. Uh, and it does look desperate, and it does look like I'm trying to be hip. Yeah, but you wore a hat on your last episode. You're wearing what I should be wearing, and I'm wearing what you should be wearing. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> That's actually true. I'm dressed like a 26-year-old, and you're dressed like a 38-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> we should swap. This is, okay, this is like crop. I got this at an Urban Outfitters. I'm not going to let you make me oh, feel bad Oh, is this new? This me. isn't vintage. No, it isn't, actually. So, she, uh, so what Taylor's wearing, she's wearing, um, have you guys seen the Golden <laughs> Girls couch? It's like the, the upholstery of the Golden Girls couch, and it's in a... Like a, sh- a button-down shirt um, because she's trying I think to pretend. fun. She's trying to pretend she's fun. I I actually am. I bought this. I sent this picture to like four people and was like, "Does this look like I'm trying to be more fun than I am?" And they're like, "Yeah, but we like it." No, it's good. I mean, it's like um, it's like a napkin at Senior Frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you even know what Senior Frogs it's is? It's a restaurant, right? Yes. Uh, it's and like- you're like a <laughs> waiter at Dick's. <laughs> Like goods? your personality. <laughs> no, that restaurant where they you pay them to be mean to you. Oh, <laughs> that's the whole theme of the restaurant is we're gonna be mean to you. Today I'm dressed like Sean White. <laughs> this is basically the look I'm going for. You wore a beanie on the last episode. I know. And I think you were like trying to look like I don't give a shit that an influencer model is a guest on my podcast. <laughs> like, I think that for me, when Amanda Cerny, who's a, a a very famous model influencer, came on, I just I wore a beanie because I wanted the option to be able to pull it over my face at any moment if I felt ugly or something. It's like a turtle just being able to like hide in my shell. And I did it a couple times. A couple times I pulled it over my face. Like, like um, you know how an ostrich puts their head in the sand? Did you really? Yeah, I did. Because we did these like prank calls and I get so uncomfortable around pranks. I don't like I don't like them that I just hid in my hat. Oh, my God. I mean, it was like the hot pink. I only saw the clip where she's like, you're jealous of me. Oh, you haven't muted me? No, I haven't. I will say, Whitney has liked a few of my posts since I <laughs> confronted you on your podcast. I've noticed you liked a couple of my posts. Do you need me to like you? Literally and figuratively. You do. Taylor. You like me so much. Like I'm obsessed with you. It's actually weird. It's confusing to me. You Why? told me in Denver that you, you're you like, well, we're closer than I am to a lot of people. And I was like, what? I think you and I are closer than a lot of people that I've spent a tremendous amount of time with. I think you and I are really inherently close. That is so interesting. Because we are the same person, and that is an insult to you. <laughs> okay, take that as an insult, because it's meant to be one. I feel like we're so similar in a lot of ways, and then we're like polar opposites in a lot of ways as well. Cooper. But also, I'm younger, and you always tell me you were exactly like this at my age. I, I feel I, When I'm with you, I feel like you are... 
you are me. I, I feel like I'm hanging out with myself at 26. Oh my God, is that so weird? It's so fucking weird, but I would never wear that shirt. You I would, would never would have worn that you shirt. wear shirts like this. So it, it is interesting because I think that it's most women's instinct to be threatened by the bitch that's nipping at her heels. Uh huh. And there's something kind of fascinating about how I've just um, pulled you into my bosom. Right. Well, it is um, it's like a, a very specific form of narcissism. <laughs> That you found someone who threatens you and you just went, no, you're me in the past and we're going to hang out and I'm going to keep a lid on you. <laughs> it's like um, it's like uh, eating your the twin that ate the other twin in the womb. Like I'm just going to fully internalize you and consume you. But I think there's something about you that like I just I didn't have like a big sister in comedy. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Or is that our relationship? Am I like your big sister? Yeah. You're like a big sister who never asks me how I'm doing, unless it's being recorded. <laughs> I'm teaching you how to build a brand in a business. You actually are. I do feel like a big sister energy here, and I'm the oldest in my family of four sisters, so it's been like actually very nice hmm. for me. Yeah. And also, yeah, I do learn a lot from you. Like, I think you are a very impressive businesswoman above so? all else. You just like you're just smart about everything and oh. you're not like you're not someone in this business who's like I'm only going to be good at this one thing and I'm going to be like totally focused on this one thing like a lot of people are. You have sort of a million plates spinning at all times and like are always just you just think about things in a really smart strategic way that is like give me an example. <clears throat> I mean can I talk about the fact that we pitched a show? Yeah, we sold a show together. We We're making a, a TV show, show together. That's yes, fun. we could totally talk about this. So, is this, sorry, I'm gonna, this is what she, maybe she's talking about. Is this too wide? Should this be tighter? Or we could always punch in later. This is me trying to micromanage camera angles. <laughs> I mean, I guess we don't need it to be that much closer, but I feel like we have a lot of, a lot of space. So, over here. this is, this is, if you guys wanna learn about Bidnath, if you Look, wanna learn, she's doing it right now. To be a Give good, me an example, living example. Whether you're giving a presentation, whether you're in a job interview, whether you're uh, shooting a show, shooting your content, stop and fix it. If you see something wrong, just stop and fix it. Thank you. Um, yeah. Because otherwise you're going to be distracted and it's going to be an elephant in the living room and everyone else is going to see the thing that you don't see. So you might as well just call it out. Yeah. So I just did that. I just adjusted my camera angle while Taylor was talking about how good of a um, strategic businesswoman I am. Yeah. Um, an example, oh, specifically, when we were writing the show, we, like, first off, we finished. We sold a TV show. To, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. Thank you um, for saying that, because I'm still, like, it didn't happen. How do you feel about it? I know you seem to have a, an odd relationship with success. Um, yeah, I don't trust it uh -huh. until it's, like, literally happening. And then when it happens, you won't trust it either, because then it's going to get taken away, possibly? Yes. Yeah. Because the, <laughs> the last time I saw you, your special had not come out yet. Uh, the first time, right? When the last time you were on this podcast, yes. Here's like, what I'm interested in. Last time you guys had, we had Taylor on this podcast. Her special had not come out. Now it's come out. It was a big, big deal. Did it fix everything? Are you fixed? <laughs> no. Are you healed? You had wild success. You got to work with me. You had a special come out on Netflix that was huge, thanks to the pandemic. Yeah. And your talent. <laughs> and your talent. The biggest thing that came out of that special was you <laughs> wanting to work with me. I worked with you. We wrote a show together. We sold it. Are you fixed? Are all the invisible wounds healed? No. Oh, success no. doesn't fix but it. You know what I will say? What? I'm not fixed, but I am like, I think much closer to being fixed than I was before we started working together because this show that we were working on, the character, my character in the show uh -huh. is a serial monogamist <laughs> who realizes they need to be alone for a while. And do you know how hard it is to go to work every day with Whitney Cummings who will not like let you even have a minute <laughs> <laughs> to like do the wrong thing emotionally <laughs> and just goes like, oh, well, you should just be doing this <laughs> and not like be super self-reflective. Like, I think I came out of writing this show learning a lot about myself because there were so many days that I like pitched ideas for storylines or jokes. And you were like, this feels like something that's is that a joke or is that just something you're going pitching? through? Yeah. Is Are we fiction pitching? or nonfiction? <laughs> What are we doing? So, yeah, I think that was a big thing. But, oh, specifically when we were writing the show, 
we finished a draft of it and you were like, I don't know what's wrong with it. I need to sleep on it. And then the next day we came back and you said, we need to rewrite the whole thing with these changes. Like, but you knew it, you trust your gut enough mm -hmm. to go, I know something's off here. Whereas I don't think I have that trust in myself yet. Interesting. Um, I mean, in my personal life or my career, I think I'm getting better at it and you're helping me get better at trusting my gut and listening to myself. No, you should trust my gut, not yours. I mean, <laughs> again, sometimes you say things and I'm like, mm, not always correct. <laughs> Today you need you're some probiotics. So, you're, you're, <laughs> you're saying it like it's right. Not enough people challenge you. <laughs> like, I love it with Taylor. Like, I think Taylor, it's been funny to watch you be sort of conditioned to think I'm right, just in terms of like just knowing of me and that I'm successful and watching me from afar. And then she'll agree with me instinctively. And then I'll watch like, you know, when your computer freezes and there's that rainbow spinny wheel uh -huh. and then I'll see the spinning wheel and she'll go, no, that's not true. Yeah. I know I'm supposed to believe you. But <laughs> yeah. Because you're you, older than me. But and I you don't, don't like people disagreeing with you. <laughs> I actually I actually do if I respect them. <laughs> OK, I guess you don't respect me. <laughs> <laughs> I have gotten so many uh, DMs from people, both strangers and people I know, when you film me like in the bathroom or something, who go like, oh my god, I have so much anxiety watching these stories of Why? Whitney filming you. Because like, they're like, oh my I'm god, Whitney's you? just like crossing a boundary here. And I'm just like, look, it's fine. We're good. But people have like checked on me. They're also crossing a boundary by DMing you and being worried about you. You're an adult. I get it. But there, there have been times where I'm like, you cannot post this. And you post and it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, like, fine. Fine. I guess I'll get more followers. <laughs> Jesus. I'm, well, it's actually, I think it was Annie Letterman who was like, so it is, I don't, I don't, I want Taylor to be famous and rich and hugely successful. You said this or Annie? Said I'm saying this. Oh, okay. I just said that. Okay. That just came out of. I, you started with Annie, so I'm like, oh, no, saying sorry. this? Yeah. And we were doing a photo shoot at my house. I believe that Taylor has some odd body dysmorphia, body shame stuff. Been there, done it. I'll give you my old journals if you want to know what's <laughs> coming next. Actually? That would be amazing. <laughs> Can we start a podcast called Whitney's Journals? I would fucking love would to, read to read your read old them. They're all just like tear stained. You can't even make it out. Just looks like watercolor paintings. <laughs> Saw another dick today. <laughs> <laughs> it just doodles in the corner, Whitney Mathers. <laughs> I wanted to be with Eminem for a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, where am I going? Uh, you were going with, uh, you were doing a photo shoot at your house. Annie. And I believe that Taylor's body should be public domain. <laughs> I, I sense some shame around your body. And I do uh -huh. too. When I first started in being a comedian, I was very ashamed of being feminine. I was very ashamed of being a woman. I was meant to... Um, be uh, think that it was like manipulative or uh, mm. my fault if guys thought I was hot or I was a siren or whatever. Like we're made to feel guilty for being attractive. Yeah. We're made to feel guilty if we're a distraction mm -hmm. to men. It's our fault if we're sexy and I'm just, I'm yeah. done with that shit. And anyway, um, and just business 101, a mm -hmm. photo of you in the pool in this really cute bikini, just... Let's get the bags. And so I put Taylor on a very precarious table. Meant for LaCroix. <laughs> Three maximum. It was, could maybe hold a uh, SPF lip balm yeah. at, on a good day. We did not know this was hollow. This was a hollow West Elm side table. Uh -huh. Had many a crack. Yeah. Saw the cracks. I put, him, I put it in the pool. And I was like, Taylor needs to stand on this. And I, I, I knew it had like a good five to eight minutes left of life. You knew that? I felt like I felt like we were gonna get the picture and then it was gonna break. Are you serious? <laughs> you knew it I, was gonna break? I was like, I know this will probably break, but like, what are the chances it's gonna break while we're filming? And then because God loves you, oh my God, it broke while we were filming. Taylor fell into it, retweeted or posted by influencers in the wild. Got uh -huh. a million views in the first day. Didn't look at it at all? Cause I was like, I'm gonna see a comment that hurts my feelings. And yeah, oh I'm no. Not gonna oh, and even... Andy Letterman was like, that was the most Chris Jenner shit I've ever seen. 
that was like brokering a sex tape, what you just did with Taylor. <laughs> because she was like, that was really dangerous. And I was like, yeah. And then I looked at my phone. I was like, my six, leg was 600. Th- I was like 600,000 likes. It's fine. And she was like, that was sociopathic. My leg was fucked up for a few weeks. Fine. Works for the jackass guys. I mean, <laughs> here, this is the businesswoman thing. Bad friend, good businesswoman. <laughs> That's your next book, by the way. <laughs> your last one was I'm Fine. The next one is uh, Bad Friend, Good Businesswoman. How was the process of writing a TV show with me? Um, surprisingly easy. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly easy. Yeah. I mean, the same way I felt about you being, uh, you know, someone that I am friends with. Mm-hmm. I'm like pleasantly surprised. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. How was it writing a TV show with me? Because um, uh, I know you don't. You've told me to keep me grateful. Yeah. Look, how, how lucky you are. A lot of people want to work with me. <laughs> and I know that now because all those people hate me, <laughs> which is really fun. Have you found that as you ascend um, to uh, uh, the next echelon of success, you've gotten negativity? Oh, I feel like I'm getting like a lot of weird positivity that I don't know what to do with. Is it like, passive aggressive or is it real? Uh, both. Mm-hmm. Like, I just can't. I, I can't tell if people like me mm-hmm. and for what reason. Interesting. Like, I don't know if you like me because I have more followers now. I don't know if you like me because I'm you? friends Is with you Whitney. Anyone. Fans or... So you're in a place where now you feel... I'm just obsessed with... Anyone listening to this podcast, I think, wants to um, achieve and ascend mm-hmm. and... And that's a mistake. I think it's really important to manage expectations of yeah. when you get everything you want, which I think the people that listen to this podcast will... Uh, if you listen closely to Auntie Whitney, uh, <laughs> that it's it's not going to solve all your problems. It's going to just be a new set of problems. It's just going to be a True. different set of problems. Um, and I was definitely um, shocked when I got what is whatever success means, ostensibly successful, and then all of a sudden everyone was mad at me. Yeah. Or they were nice to me for the wrong reasons. Right. And I was suspicious. And I was like, oh, God, I just did this because I wanted people to love me and like me. And now everyone either loves me and likes me for the wrong reasons or doesn't like me. This totally backfired. That was my right. first impulse. Yeah. And I will say, so grateful for everything. What I love about having Benton on tour with us is when we're bitching and complaining, Benton is like... Literally so many people would love to be where you are and you need to remember that. Mm -hmm. And it's so incredibly healthy and helpful to have that. And also from someone who's like so funny and grateful and appreciative every day. Like Benton's just the best. Benton, anytime I complain, Benton's like, oh, great. Want to trade? Right. Exactly. Want to trade? And you're like, got it. Thank you. And I have friends like that too. He keeps me so humble. Yeah. My my friends are like that too, where they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Is it hard? Like doing a show with Whitney and you don't know if a couple girls like you? Like, shut the fuck up. Like, it's... It is true. And if you weren't if you weren't doing a show with me or if you weren't successful, they'd not like you for another reason. Oh, they already didn't yeah, it, like me. Probably. Like, it's so stupid. But yeah, I mean, I literally asked you in Denver. I was like, is this person uh, following me or messaging me or something because they want to sleep with you? <laughs> because with me, I have felt a like- male comedian messaged Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, but this is about you. I think it's really important. Like I was um, on a bike ride this morning uh-huh. uh, thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about. And one of the main things was how we fill in the blanks is our business. How mm. we fill in the blanks is ours. So someone DM'd you. Everything's a Rorschach test. Mm-hmm. A project we're projection machines right right so you got a dm from someone mm-hmm. and then you made up a story you wrote the subtext which was that someone said flirted with taylor and she decided that the flirt was to try to get to me even though this guy has my phone number and email and could flirt with me direct and my instagram mm-hmm. could flirt with me directly at any moment right this is what i like to call bad science this is just bad science but bad you're scientist. so intimidating and i'm not yeah, but I've known this person for 15 years. I know, but still. If we were going to fuck, we would have fucked by now. I know. I just... Uh, but so, but, right, but, 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 but it's important. There's no... Take the judgment out of it. Uh-huh. You showed up to that exchange uh-huh. with a people are using me to get to someone else. Why wouldn't right. they want you? I mean... The younger, cuter... Not true. ...version of I am me younger. ...with bangs. I mean, you hate them, so... <laughs> No, I like your bangs. We just need to work on how to style them. Are you serious? Well, yeah, they look... Um, Are you being serious right now? Well, right now, they they look a little... Have you seen the... Um, don't the, do this. The, <laughs> don't. I'm just telling you right now. Don't do it. We just, don't do it. 
Okay. I know what you're doing. You're doing it for content. Okay, you not, don't even I'm, feel this way. I'm not. You're doing this for content. Whitney does a thing where she just says fucked up shit because it's funny. <laughs> and then we talk later and you're like, oh, no, I actually really like it. And I'm like, well, why would you say that publicly? Like, no, I've done, I've gone to couples called therapy business. with a sociopath. I know what you're called doing. It's called business. It's called <laughs> business. It's called I, being a mogul. Try if it. If you have never pitched a show with Whitney Cummings and you wish you could, this is what it's like. You get on the Zoom call and then she proceeds to make fun of your hair, face, body. And if she can't find anything there, she will make fun of the art in your apartment. <laughs> she will find a way to demean you in front of every television executive that is uh, that you will be working for and pitching to for years and finds a way to say something that cuts you down. But then 10 minutes later is like, Taylor is the voice of her generation. <laughs> and you have to come out of it feeling very like weird and Stockholm syndrome-y. And you know what? At first it really affected me. And now I just go, nope, that's yours. I know what's happening. And that's you. And the fucked up thing is, I have learned how to stand up to you from you. <laughs> Isn't that fucked up? You're welcome. You are, I mean, you're my new dad. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> kind of emotional. I do think a lot of what I'm doing is testing you and trying to make you tougher. Right, and I'm fine. So that you can handle me. Right. You I'm training able... you to fight me. Yes. And eventually, I'm training you. This is like, what is it when Han Solo got killed by his own son? I feel like. What is it? It's is, a that, movie? is that how it goes? It's Spoiler a... alert. <laughs> yeah. Kylo I feel like Ren. I'm training you to eventually. Uh, exterminate me. Murder you. Yeah. You want out. <laughs> I'm, I'm training you to fight me at some point. Right. You've told me that. You're like, I want us to get so successful. I want us to have a falling out over money or something stupid. Like, Oh, that'd be my dream. It's so weird that you want that. And I'm just here like trying to form lasting relationships that enrich mm -hmm. and fulfill my life. How's that going? And I mean, besides this pretty well, um, <laughs> I mean, I have left your home very emotionally <laughs> texting all of my friends that I've had for a long time going like, I'm so glad we're friends. <laughs> because it is exhausting sometimes being in this coven you've built. Yeah. Where I'm just like, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. And like, everyone here is great and talented and cool, but I am not, I feel very disconnected in this space. I'm not like a group person. Yeah. I'm, I was like that. Yeah. I'm very much like a one or two people at a time type mm -hmm. of person. And what do you think that is? I think it's just my personality. I think I'm kind of introverted. Mm -hmm. And like, and I think it's important to, uh, explain what introverted means because I got the definition wrong for a very long time. Uh -huh. Introverted is not is that you derive energy from being alone and extroverted is you d derive energy from being with other people. Right. So I used to think I was extroverted because I was like, I do stand up and I'm like loud and I talk a lot, but that doesn't mean it's not depleting me. After right. I do a podcast, after I do stand up, you see me on the road, like I, I can't talk. Yeah. For the whole rest of the night. Yeah. You know, like I don't talk all day to anybody. And then I go do stand up at eight o'clock and I'm like, ah, and I want to. Whereas extroverts, like one of my best friends, Dory, she has dinner plans every night. She'll do a drinks, a dinner, a Zoom. She's like, she. So brave. I would be exhausted. She derives and ener it energizes her. It fuels her. And right. so I think it's it's not your personal preference. Like I like being alone. It's just how you derive energy. I think it's important to yeah. delineate those when when so that you're not over pathologizing yourself. Oh, completely. I don't think I dislike being with people. I think it's just again, it's draining me yes. as opposed to filling me up. Yes. So when I enter a room, it's like I started a road trip where I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm getting less and less gas. Yeah. And at a certain point, I'm gonna have to find a gas station, and I can't wait till I'm on empty. Otherwise, shit's going to get dicey. I feel like when you're around a lot of people, it, 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 it's exhausting because you have to shape shift for each person. I asked that because that's how I used to be. It was right. sort of like this person, like I would be exhausted in a group of people before a couple years ago because I was like, well, I have to be small for this person. I have to be big for this person. I have to give advice to this person. I have to be funny for this person. I right. have to not be funny for this person. So it was like, I felt like I was constantly just like shape-shifting, shape-shifting. Right. And that was exhausting. I don't think I do that. I don't think I shape -shift. I don't either. I think I'm pretty much the same all the time. I think what shifts is however people interpret my personality or something like you have a little bit of a do you think it exhausts you like wondering if you're 
doing well with the person or you're worried the person doesn't like you or you're worried your presence is triggering to them because you got successful recently. I feel like there's a little of that. There's a little bit of that last one. Like I think. you don't want to. I want to make people comfortable. Mm -hmm. If I feel any like weirdness yeah. with someone, uh -huh. even if they don't think there is or they think it's just on their end, like I'm very direct. I'm very like open. I'm just like, I just need to say this and it's not a thing, yeah. but I just got to like get this out here. Like, and if I can't do that with somebody, like I, I've known whatever, female comics, female actors, male comics, male actors, where I'm just like, oh, you're never going to be direct with me. Yeah. And that's fine, but I just don't interact with those people. Yeah. Because it's a waste of time. But it's also, yeah, that's right. And also coming to someone with a, hey, let me be direct with you, that doesn't mean they're capable of receiving it. And that doesn't right. mean they're capable of being direct back. Right. To a lot of people, that is interpreted as an attack or a criticism, and their defense is come up yeah. and then you're just in trauma response mode and then it's like pointless. Right. You know what I mean? And they're right. triggered and they're just like, you know, ego is running the show. But sometimes people are great and sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want anywhere to see there and I'm glad we're friends. Like a, a lot of times it goes great yeah. and people appreciate it. You know what's interesting about you? What? <laughs> if you bring up my bangs again, I swear <laughs> to fucking God, Whitney. It feels like a goddamn trap. No, what is it? No, I mean, I just was thinking about you this morning and I just was like, what if the worst that's happened to you has happened? That would be so great. <laughs> it I, probably has. What if nothing's wrong? That's something we say in Al-Anon where we go, what if nothing's wrong? What, right then, now, then what? That's then what? True. I mean. What if just for today, nothing's wrong? What would you do? I don't know. What would happen? <laughs> would you be okay? Could you handle being out of the woods? Do you keep planting trees to make sure the woods stay, you stay in the woods? I don't think I'm planting trees. <laughs> you I think get I'm out of the woods and start planting trees. So <laughs> I don't think I'm planting trees. I think I'm just looking at the soil real hard. Like, if there's a tree coming, I'm going to fucking so see it. So you have a, the uh, shoe is going to drop. All the time. All the time. What if it shoes. dropped already? Um, I mean, a lot of shoes have dropped. Uh -huh. And sometimes I was like, look, I was right. And sometimes I'm like, didn't even see that coming. Uh-huh. Got to gotta be even more of a swivel. Because I think the main thing I have with you is like, I have to give you the dignity of your own experience and let you learn on your own. But there's other times where I'm like, oh, I just, my biggest regret about my 20s is that I didn't enjoy it because I was right. so busy worrying about things going wrong. Yeah. And I didn't realize that everything that had gone wrong already went wrong. Right. And that now things were actually going right, but I couldn't tell the difference. When things started going right, all I did was anticipate the Damocles sword falling, so I couldn't mm. enjoy it. And I know, I, I hate it when people say, just enjoy it, just have fun. Like, e easier said than done. Like, I have, you know, you have 26 years of neural pathways that have been crystallized because something, you know, your mom died when you were young. Like, mm -hmm. of course, the worst thing's always going to happen. Like, right. that is such a major trauma on the brain. Um, but... I just wish that I had earlier in my life not uh, wasted so much time expecting things to go wrong. That is definitely what I've been working on the most this year. And I think the pandemic honestly really helped me with that because I was like, oh, everything can go away. Yeah. And it's happened. Yeah. And it's There's like, something liberating about everything going wrong. Fully. Because now nothing's going to go wrong. Yeah. Well, after my dad died a couple years ago, there was something... Obviously, it broke my heart, uh, but I think it kind of broke my heart is my friend Nikki uh, from college. You met Nikki. Yeah. Said, she goes, you know, if you're going to have your heart broken, make sure it breaks open. Mm. And when my dad died, there was sort of like a, well. Oh, that's so beautiful. I know. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> Shout out to Nikki. Wow. <laughs> the best. So. Just make sure it breaks open. Don't let yeah. it broke break inside. Yeah. And after my dad, I was like. Well, that's done. What's the worst? Come at me, bro. Like there's yeah. a come at me yeah. thing. I'm referencing a meme because I'm young and I wear hats. It's really good. That come at me, bro. It's like an anteater that's like, come at me, bro. Or maybe it's a panda on a swing. I don't know. Uh -huh. Now I'm just doing my act. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's, there's a, I just wish you had more of a come at me mentality of just like the shoes drop. Like what, like. I, I just want you to way. go down the slide. Oh, totally. You know the roller coasters? They go tick, 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 and you're going up, 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 up. Like, I feel like you're always going up, 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 up. Like, mm -hmm. when do you get to go down? When do you get to go wee? Right. Oh, I, I really do kind of feel like that very recently. Yeah, and that I think, shirt is... is t <laughs> I mean... <laughs> this is your... <laughs> this I do look like I work at a water park. <laughs> That's right. Speaking of going down the slide, 
That's what it looks like. It looks like I got a summer job <laughs> at a water park. Exactly what it is. And I'm like just on my phone, like, all right, go. <laughs> go. You look that looks like a shirt. <laughs> That in an 80s sitcom that a racist costume designer would give to the waiter at a Mexican restaurant? I mean, I really, <laughs> I like it. I think it's fun. It's, I like that it has every color in it. Like, you could have a crazy nail color I don't right now, but it would, like, still look like it went together. I'm super into this for you. Because you. I, I feel like you self-deprive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. And <laughs> you do. You self-deprive a little bit. And you yeah. don't celebrate enough with your um, clothes and life and choices. Oh, my goodness. So we've been talking to Taylor Tomlinson this episode about self-care, mental health. You cannot have mental health unless you have physical health, Menton. Well, so much to tell me. <laughs> so much to let my body know. I just told you. Um, <laughs> Daily Harvest. Yeah. That is, listen, if I. I don't, don't even say anything. I'm just going to hold this up. I'm holding it up. <laughs> For those of you not, list, not watching, I'm holding up a Daily Harvest. What more do you need to know? They've nailed it, dude. They nailed it. It's everything healthy in a carton that's pre-done, super cute, simple pack. I'm a sucker for like elegant, Me too. cute packaging. It's not like embarrassing or like just doesn't look just like trash. It just makes me feel like such an adult. Like, yeah, if so I want to feel like a glowing icon, I grab one of these from the freezer. Everything pop it in the healthy blender. you need in here and it's done. I'm on the go. I feel like a mom picking up her kid at her yoga. <laughs> I just am like, it makes me feel like an adult with their shit together. <laughs> it makes it very easy to be healthy, for it, sure. It also just like checks all the, it's like fast, it's simple, it's easy, it's healthy, it's organic. And I feel like, um, I don't know, I just, I feel less crazy when I eat these. I feel like I'm not a mess. You know, sometimes like you eat and you're like, oh God, did I just eat like a bar in the car and you're hungry and you don't know if you're hungry or not. And then you have low blood sugar and then it fucks up your whole day. You don't get to eat unhealthy. That is rude to the people around down. you. I'm just saying, if you're not eating well, it's a disservice to the people around you because they have to deal with your moods and your low blood sugar and your bad health and your complaining and your bad sleep. Like, you don't get to not eat well. You have no excuse. The only excuse you had before Daily Harvest was, well, it's hard and it's complicated and who has time to go to the farmer's market and get all the fruit? And blah, blah, blah. Fair until now. Daily harvest, no excuses. Yeah, you should be with, hangry. You have no excuses to be hangry. You show up with one of those, a little straw in it, it's a little hole for a straw on the top. That's so good. No, that's on this of one. The, of that, the, that's yeah, not the a smoothie. smoothie ones. This is the smoothie. So this is the daily harvest smoothie with a cacao and avocado. Yeah, I'm that guy now. And it's delicious. And if and you show up with one of those, people know you're ready to work. Look at this. And then you just blend it up, and then there's a hole for the straw. It's like, what haven't they thought of, these people? Daily I mean, Harvest. And then, sorry, this one is the oat bowl with mulberry and dragon fruit. I'm never going to buy a dragon fruit on my own. I don't know how to cut a dragon fruit. I don't know what to do with that. I'm not the girl from Game of Thrones. I don't know how to tame a dragon fruit. Okay. Yeah, but if you have one of those, people are like, what are you drinking? You're like, dragon fruit. <laughs> dragon fruit and mulberry. I guess I'm just better than you. Yeah, I guess maybe I'm just you're not better ready than for you. the meeting today, but I'm having dragon Dude, fruit. Dude, you bring this to work and your coworkers are like, damn, that bitch. <laughs> that is exactly what Oats, it is. Oats, raspberry, Blueberry, dragon fruit, and mulberry. You just fill it with a cup of milk, uh, all the uh, three fourths of the way up to the top, and then you can like soak it overnight in the fridge. You can eat it right there. You can heat it. It's up to you. It's your world. And if you're someone who likes like to chew food, they don't just have smoothies. They have crisp flatbreads. <laughs> Yes, they those have are a lot of so comfort good. foods. They have soups, which I'm. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. We're fans of soups. Yeah, the bro <laughs> There's a broccoli soup that is like to die for. I mean, everything they make is so good and so easy. You can bring and you bring them to um, work. I guess people are working remotely uh, a lot now, but you bring them. You put them in the fridge. That's it. I've been bringing them on planes recently because we've been traveling so much. Yeah, so you don't bring don't, anything on a plane. So that I, <laughs> so that I don't eat trash in the airport. Just bring this so that you're not stuck eating some garbage and then you're dehydrated and you're a mess and not fun to. Be around. Um, also, it's just guilt free on so many levels. There's it, no preservatives, no added sugars, no artificial ingredients. No trash. I mean, they've really thought of it all. You just keep them in your freezer. Your I mean, fridge. if you hate yourself, don't get it. That is a, yeah, that's a good If you hate yourself, <laughs> don't buy this product. It that's won't, a good way to it look won't at it. match your brand. If you like yourself, buy it. If you want to continue being sick and unhealthy uh, and malnourished, do not buy this product by all means. Daily Harvest is not for you. <laughs> Such an aggressive ad. 
<laughs> Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat clean, undeniably delicious food no matter what your day brings. Keep it simple with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com, enter promo code good for you to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code good for you. $25 off. That's like a couple of these. Off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Dailyharvest.com. Really quick. Don't cut this out. Leslie Grossman is who taught me about Daily Harvest before we even had a podcast. Daily, uh, uh, Leslie Grossman, who is like super busy mom, friend of mine, one of the smartest people I know. She's in a lot of Ryan Murphy's shows. She was on po- the show Popular. Mm-hmm. She put this on her Instagram and made one. And I was like, what is that? So just FYI, just true story about why this is really a product I use. Speaking of products I use, are we just going to keep rolling through? Let's just keep rolling through. I, this is not a joke. This is not a joke. I'm fully, oh, sorry, Mona, wearing me undies. Those pants are tight, huh? Would you not focus on that? <laughs> I'm wearing me undies. Now what? I mean, I'm always wearing me undies. Who's realer than me? Doing an ad for me undies, already wearing them. I mean, it's hard not to wear them when they're delivered to your house every month, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just saying, I have a whole basket of underwear in where I'm staying, in my attic, and I see all my underwear and I dig around for the MeUndies. I mean, I only have MeUndies at this point. I've had MeUndies. Oh, see, I still have some of my old underwear and your old underwear, your ratchet ass old underwear that looks like little nasty, crusty dental floss. Next to the MeUndies, you're like, oh, get them out of here. That's why I get rid of them all. Because I literally, I've had a MeUndies subscription now for three years. Oh, that's, see, I I have have so many underwear. I only have like seven MeUndies and I portion, or what's the word? I like parse them out to be like, okay, I'm going to wear these tomorrow and I'm going to wear these on the plane and I have something important on Friday. I got to, like, I'll, I'll ration my MeUndies because I know they put me in a better mood. Like today, I almost put on this old, like sketchy pair of underwear I had, and I was like, this is a big day, I need my MeUndies. Yeah, and there's different styles. I didn't even know we were reading a MeUndies ad today. There's different styles too, so you can really, you know, pick and choose what you kind of, what mood you're in. There's boy shorts and thongs and full coverage and all that. (laughs) And they also make socks, which I don't know if you've ever tried the socks, but the socks are legit the best sock I've ever worn. It's the only thong that doesn't feel like it's sawing you in half. Because they're made of the softest material. They're like a, it's like they're it's made of, hugging your butthole. They're made of mother nature. Hugging your taint. The only mother who should be touching Caressing your private. Caressing your crevices. So gentle. Like a, like a. Um, it's like hummingbirds pulled them on you, isn't it? <laughs> like, a, like a considerate lover. Your, your meundies just glide onto your nether regions lovingly sensitively and bring you to climax emotional climax i think your me undies might be a little different <laughs> do yours vibrate because i don't do that <laughs> me undies they're my favorite underwear if you guys haven't tried them they're the best underwear I, I, on, honestly like it's a game changer what the underwear you're wearing it starts off your day my day is totally decided by how comfortable they have halloween ones out now too <gasps> I don't have any. Which ones? There, I mean, there's a little whole bunch ghosts? of different options. Yeah, oh, that's funny to wear. There's like rat. bones, I think, on some of I them. Want one that's, cute. I want one that has a little ghost on it. So when I'm hooking up with a guy, they just know. That you're going to leave. I'm, yeah, I'm about to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> or that you're dead inside. About to ghost you. <laughs> that it be so much easier so when you put in the caution tape. That, that there's little just, ghosts in my uterus. <laughs> yeah, you should have those, those ghosts underwear. Because it'd be so much easier than you always writing caution dead inside above your vagina. MeUndies has a great offer for my listeners. For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. No-brainer, especially because they have 100% satisfaction guarantee. To get your 15% off your first pair, free shipping, and 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash Whitney. MeUndies.com slash Whitney. Another thing I've learned from you, is, your hair's pink. And at first, it. I think I was like, what are you doing? Yeah, is she okay? And I'm like, it looks good, but also- I attached my wagon right? to the wrong star. And honestly, every time I was like, maybe you dye it back for this one event. And you were like, fuck you, it's good. And I'm like, yeah. it actually is good. <laughs> like, it can be both. That's yeah. why I'm like, mm, don't go there. Like, yeah. we know this is good. So again, I've learned a lot from that. I, I see you like enjoying your life in a way that I don't think you have before this. And I've right. only met you since you started doing it. Yep. And I, I just thought you've been like this for a while. No. And so it's taken I me a like while. I was like you. I know. It's taken me a while to go, oh, Whitney's like enjoying being successful for the first yep. time. Yep. And I just met her at that moment. Mm-hmm. 
And I thought you've been like this for a long time. So it's great for me because mm -hmm. I'm benefiting from your experience. Yes. Which is like. Someone has to. So valuable. But the, the come at me bro mentality. I've definitely felt like that in the last year because like. What are you going to do? Hurt, like what are you going to do? Hurt me? Yeah. Like that's my thing. What is the worst that can happen? It's like. You know, and we'll talk about, you know, dating and, and relationships in a second, but it's just sort of like, what are you going to do? Like, that's my thing. What yeah. are you going to break my heart? It's broken. Right. What are you going to hurt me? I'm hurt. What yeah. are you going to wound me? I'm fucking wounded. Like, yeah. bring it. Yeah. Like, I think, and there's a, um, for those of you that, that are sort of resonating with this mentality or feel at all like connected to this, there's um, the tools, Phil Stutz and Barry, I can't remember his last name, uh, Phil Stutz, who um, amazing, like, psychotherapist, super famous. He had a great episode of Marin um, that we've referenced on the show before. They wrote a book called The Tools. It's a little bit corny. It's a little bit, am like if you listen to this podcast, you're probably way more advanced than some parts of the book, but there, it's all these like mental tools on how mm -hmm. to have perspective and gratitude and live more in the present. Like one of them is the deathbed exercise where you imagine yourself on your deathbed and like what choices you would make if you were on your deathbed. Yeah. And one of them is called the reversal of desire where you actively crave the very thing that you fear Ooh. so that you just get it and visualize moving through it. Right. So you just, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it, after I read it, I, I found myself doing the exercises. I mean, it, it seems lame because you're basically like, I want to be cheated on. Like you right. have to like say it out loud and like yell it and and crave it. And it's a really powerful exercise because it makes you realize like if the worst thing that could happen to me happened, like I'd still be okay. Oh yeah. And that the fear of the thing happening is so much worse than the thing happening. Yes. So I remember like when I, I had a situation where uh, I was in a bad relationship shocker of the day and or no whatever you? I was, yeah, it was it was it wasn't bad at the time you don't know it's bad when you're in it necessarily it was what it was and I got right. so many gifts from it I, I like to call my bad exes Santa Claus because they just gave me so many gifts oh. <laughs> and you worship them blindly <laughs> and they only came once a year yeah um and <laughs> and they had a wife <laughs> <laughs> and they live with children yeah, I was gonna say, and they, that work for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. They didn't have a real car. <laughs> and so um, I remember talking to my therapist, Georgia, who I, um, you guys know, and she was like, let's just walk through the worst case scenario. Because right. it's like, he's going to leave me. I'm going to leave it, whatever. And we just walk through it. And you like visualize yourself going through the thing you're so scared of. And you're like, yeah, I'd be fine if that happened. Yeah. That's the weird thing. It's the amorphous, vague fear of what could happen. As soon as you get specific going, okay, the worst thing that could possibly happen mm -hmm. to you is right now. What? I get kidnapped and held in a basement for 22 years and have to have my captors babies. Do you have your phone? Can you no. live stream it? Or, no. Oh, that's pretty bad. So you can, Oh, don't no, play there, this fucking game with me, There's no Wi-Fi? This isn't going to work out. <laughs> this will not sell the tools book. I can think of the worst thing. <laughs> there's no Wi-Fi in the cave? No, the worst thing is that happens to one of my family members, and we never find them, and I never know what happened to them ever. Look, the, the Vow is doing very well oh on HBO God. Max. Is that what happens in the Vow? Do we get to make a documentary at the end? If It'll so. work out for someone else. Yeah, if you want to think of it that way, Ugh. if you want to be all Christian about it and be like, it's so part of God's plan. Your biggest fear is that you will get kidnapped. No, I have a lot of big fears. My biggest fear is that something will happen to one of my sisters. That's mm -hmm. my, one of my biggest fears. And because your mom died so young that in your hippocampus, and like that makes sense. That tracks for yes. you. Yes, 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 yes. But think about the problem. This is where I go with that. When my, uh, after my, my mom and my dad had strokes the same year, which right. is like pretty, the probability of that happening is pretty low. Yeah, that's So to me, I just, I just get into math. I just go like, your mom died when you were eight. Like, what are the chances your sisters are also going to, you know what I mean? This is like, who do you think you are that you're going to be the outlier? Then I just go like, oh my God, maybe my fear that I got honestly mm -hmm. has transmuted into me thinking I'm constitutionally like special. Like, am I going to be the one that, like, whose mom died at eight and then whose sister died? I feel the opposite way. I feel like 
I'm not, I know that I'm not special mm -hmm. and life is random. And I yeah. grew up thinking that it wasn't. But like, I, what are the mathematical chances? I, I like to just go I to math know. because feelings are not math. Feelings are in facts. Right. They're not, they're bad. Feelings are just bad math. Yeah. It's horrible math. And so for me, I'm just like, it feels like my sister could die at some point. Right. Why wouldn't it? My brain is designed to protect me. Yeah. And given what's happened to me, that makes perfect sense to right. my monkey brain, my monkey mind. But like mathematically, what are the chances? Yeah, you go, this could happen. Yeah. It makes sense that I'm worried about it. Uh-huh. But worrying about it is isn't going to help anything. And in fact, it's going to make you sick and right. and age you. Right. Faster. Yeah. And I just, I find, and maybe this isn't for you, ta walking through something like that yeah. just helps me because I just go like, yeah, I'd be okay. But yeah, let's do like more fun fears. Like, <laughs> you know, like one of my biggest fears is that I would like fall in love with somebody and I would be wrong about them and like lose who I thought was the love of my life. And like that happened to me mm -hmm. a year ago. Yeah. And I am so grateful now. I was grateful like two months after that I knew who that person was and it I didn't marry them and all these things and that was my worst possible fear and it gave me such a come at me bro yeah mentality going into my next relationship where I was kind of like you know if something horrible happened which it didn't but I was like if something horrible happened I could handle it because I just did the worst hardest thing and the thing I was most afraid of and the most like obsessively trying not to make happen. Like I was so, I was trying to be so perfect in that relationship every day, all the time. Yuck. And when it fell apart, I was like, oh, I, I like made it about me. I was like, well, this is my fault. I could have been doing more. And I'm like, you literally couldn't have given any more blowjobs. But like, <laughs> I just, <laughs> no, I, I just. Maybe that's what would fix my salivary gland. <laughs> I, mean, I have a shot. blocked salivary gland and I need you to produce more saliva. No, yeah. I'm, I have a house. I'm not <laughs> easy. I have a I house. Give, I give blowjobs with my vagina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're very efficient. Business woman. <laughs> Um, it's called multitask. But yeah, that was like my biggest fear is that I was going to find uh, who I thought was like my soulmate and then I would lose them because I, I was wrong. And it happened and I was like, oh, and then two months later I was dating somebody great who I connected with really deeply and like you know, yeah. had more experiences that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And like my special turned out better and I worked on myself more. And like, you know, there's just, yeah. But the more shit you go through, the more evidence you have to point to that like, I'm going to be fine if more fucked up shit happens to me. But it's also the same way. It's like the harder you train in the gym, the better your butt's going to look. Right. The harder your relationships you are, are obsessed with my butt. The, I am obsessed <laughs> with your butt. The it's like it's like on, it's like we should call HR <laughs> the my HR department in my house. I should should have <laughs> one, frankly. Um, I'm just saying it's like, you know, what really helped me on my journey was that <laughs> comparing working out in the gym, mm -hmm. exercising and how your it changes your body with the work you do on your brain and how it changes your brain, yes. you know? So it's like, if you are going hard in relationships and practicing relationships, it's all practice. Dates are all, pra it's all practice. Yep. Just look at it as practice. Look at it as training. Yep. The harder you train, the better your body, the stronger your body's going to be. The harder you train in relationships, the stronger your mind is going to be. And the more evidence you're going to have and the more proof and the, the better you're going to get to know yourself. Like you cannot look at relationships as failures. Um, it's all just practice. Yeah. Yeah. It's this, just practice. I'm not religious anymore, but one thing that they did say, like, I don't know if it was youth group or church or something at one point, was uh, when you pray for patience, God doesn't give you patience. He gives you opportunities to be patient. Interesting. Which I think is basically what you just said, which is just you have to treat everything as practice. Like, you can't get better at being in a relationship without being in a relationship. That's right. But you also need to practice calling it when you need to call it. Yes. So I think for me, I was thinking about um, you because oh, I had this situation recently. You've seen me dating. Yes. You've seen. It's wild. <laughs> I've, it's a lot. For someone who has read so many books. <laughs> Holy shit. 
what have you learned? What have oh you? Oh my god! What have you gleaned? I have seen you in two very. Di- I've only seen you in two different things. Yeah, and it has been polar opposite. Polar opposite. So weird. I Which mean, is interesting because I think I think I think we should talk about this. Really? Can we? I mean, I don't want to get into too specific, but you talk about. I don't care. I mean, at this point, okay. I mean, we can edit. At it. this point, trust me. I I last night was thinking about this. And I got emotional, and I'll probably get emotional if I think about it now, which is that sharing my personal life, my private life, like writing a book about having eating disorders and like all this stuff. I recently shared something on a podcast about love addiction and my experience Mm -hmm. with it. And I believe it might have made something weird with someone I'm dating because they don't know what the definition means or whatever. And... Or not. It, it might have made something weird. It might not have. There was a little bit of a weird reaction to it. Mm. And I had this fear that it's like, oh, my God, do I overshare? And is this going to me doing this podcast and sharing all these intimate details about my life, which I do because I want to be able to be of service to people and I want to be able to be the person that I wish I had when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Like I wish, I just am trying to make the podcast that I wish was available when I was 20 and trying to figure shit out. And, um, and am I doing this at the expense of my own personal life? Right. Maybe. Yeah. On the other hand, you're trying to destroy our friendship, (laughs) which is supposedly very important to you. (laughs) Uh, you mean business partnership? (laughs) Wait, friendship. Sorry. What's the difference? I am obsessed with you. You I I do do love love you. Um, Um, and then I vacillate and I go, well, if this scares this person off, then you, I don't fuck with, you don't fuck with me. I don't fine. Like Mm -hmm. if, if this scares you off, bye dude. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because I am always torn and I think anyone at any level of social media, whether you have 10 followers or 10 million followers, like we should be careful with what we share yeah, for professional reasons and personal reasons and be careful and mm. take care of ourselves and protect ourselves. Restraint of pen and tongue is a form of self-care. Mm. Not everyone needs to know everything all the time. Yes. It gives sick people just weapons to hurt you later mm-hmm. or it can just expose someone to your vulnerabilities too soon or you can trauma bond with somebody. That's sort of a thing I want to talk about with you. I mm. I truly believe, I wish I'd known this in my 20s, that when you're dating someone, start dating someone, do not share too much too soon about your traumas, about your alcoholic dad, yeah. about your breakups. Just like s- save it. Save it. Like, no, but I have a podcast. So right. if you're, I say that to you guys, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. And I'm, because otherwise you're going to trauma bond with that person and you're going to get a false sense of intimacy. Mm -hmm. If on a first date you're like, and my sister's in jail and my, I had this assault in my life. It's like, it's too much information too quick. Yep. And the person is going to maybe pity you or feel sorry for you. Mm. And then they're, and then you're always going to wonder, are you just with me? Cause you feel bad for me. You're going to get a false sense of intimacy. It's just, it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's too much too soon. Mm -hmm. Um, or you're just giving people too much of yourself before they've earned it. That's right. Not that they pity you, but they're like, oh my gosh, this person feels so close to me. And it's yes. like, no, 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 I'm trying to feel close to you because I desperately want to feel close to someone. And you don't want to feel too close to someone too soon because then uh, after a first date, they, they're they probably still dating other people. Right. You don't know what the fuck's going on. You don't know who they're following. You don't know who's yeah. commenting on their shit. And then you're setting yourself up to be victimized later because then you've shared all this stuff. Two days later, you see that some girls comment on his post. You're like, but I've shared all this stuff. Right, but they have so much of me. That was your fault. You shouldn't have shared all that. Yeah. They didn't ask for that. Mm -hmm. Hold it. Yes. And, you know, have restraint of pen and tongue. And do not overshare. Like, that is something that I wish I knew younger. But uh, I'm really being circuitous to get to this. So... You've seen me in two different things. Yes. I'm oversharing, and if the person hears this, fuck it. Um, Which one? I'm fine being alone. Honestly, like we know. I, don't get <laughs> defensive. Just share. You don't have to go. And I'll be fine. <laughs> we know. House. I have. You're fine. I have pink hair. I have hats. You're doing great. I, like I, everyone knows that. I just I, I'm like a little bit at a point in my life, and I and I don't know if it's something that you should learn from or the people listening could learn from, which is just like. I don't know if I've already exposed too much of myself. Right. I might have, that ship might have sailed. Mm. 
you know, because I, I personally just like, I don't want to have secrets. That's part of why I started a podcast, like, and part of why the podcast is what it is. Like, I just personally don't want to have secrets mm -hmm. from anyone. Yeah. Um, and I, I found myself feeling a little bit ashamed of the thing that I shared on social media the other day that this person kind of had a weird reaction to. And then I was just like, you know what? I, 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 you're, you're in or you're out. Did you share that you had been a love addict well, before? Love addiction, or I think just the, what it love was? Love addiction is like, I think something that's really misunderstood. Love addiction, uh, I think a lot of people think it's just like, they're in love all the time. That's, uh, that's not true. Love addiction is essentially when you're in relationships you can't get out of, you can't mm. extricate yourself from them because it's become addictive in some way. So it doesn't mean like you're constantly in love. Most love addicts, whatever they're doing is not love. <laughs> <laughs> it's chemical addiction. You're recreating your childhood circumstances and you're stuck in something. So um, the way that I like to define addiction is, uh, you know, when your life becomes unmanageable mm -hmm. and when you when something stops being fun. Mm -hmm. So that's when something becomes an addiction. Right. So when someone's like drinking or a marriage, it becomes like an obligation instead <laughs> of is fun. So the whole point of heroin and cocaine is supposed to be fun. But then you're right. addicted to it when it's like you're just doing it because you have to to check this neurochemical box and it's not even fun anymore. Right. That's an addiction. When it becomes an obligation, you're not even getting those dopamine hits. You're just serving your tolerance. Yeah. So and you can't it stops being a choice. Mm. Stops being a choice. So if I choose to have rosé on a Sunday, I'm a normie. If I have to have the, that rosé at two o'clock or else I'm going right. to get a headache and I'm going to be angry and, you know, I'm going to start yelling at people. That's when it's an addiction. Right. So for me, if I can't choose to leave a relationship at any point that's bad for me, that's not serving me, that's hurting me, that's when it's an addiction. Right. Because I don't I can't leave. Mm -hmm. So I've been in relationships where I'm like, I feel stuck because of my codependence. I feel like their hooks are in me. If I leave, they're going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. They can't live without me. Mm -hmm. They need me. This is all, these are addictive thoughts. Mm -hmm. They need me. I'm going to hurt them. They're going to kill themselves, whatever that nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I'll, I'll be alone or I'll, I, yeah. Wh I'm you too old. Them. Yeah. This ship has, I, I might as well just stay. I'll fall apart. I'll fall apart. Or like you start doing the math of like, I remember in, in, um, when I was dating Santa Claus, um, I would, I was like, well, I'm 32. And like, by the time I meet someone else, it's gonna be two years and then I'll have a baby. Like you start doing that timeline shit, right. which the socially constructed shit and biology, biology sexist. So when you start rationalizing, minimizing, justifying why you should stay in something that has nothing to do with wanting to be in it and feeling good. Right. So that's what, that's an addict, that's love addiction. It okay. doesn't mean you just fall in love with everyone that you see on the street. That's not what love addiction is. It's but you are always looking for that and trying to create that with people. A toxic relationship? Yeah, right? No. Isn't that being a love addict? Because you can be in a relationship like that and be addicted to a relationship and not be a love addict. I feel like love addicts have a pattern of doing that over and over and over again because they're so scared of being alone. And uh -huh. they're like, if I'm alone, I'm worthless. I'm going to fall apart. No, no, no. Love and addicts addicted can be, I was single for two, I, I didn't date for two years. Like you, Interesting. Yeah, you can, it's when you're in the relationship what happens. Really? It's not that you're always in one. So it's like um, being an alcoholic. Uh -huh. When you're not drinking, you're, st I guess, still an alcoholic, but you're not an active addiction. It's when you're when you start to drink, that's when it becomes a problem. So for me, it's like I after I took like two years off of dating and sex and everything. Like I just like took a break and I wasn't like, I want to date you. I want to date you. Like I was like super cool being right. on my own. It's once you enter into the dance and the neurochemicals start firing and your childhood circumstances start being recreated, that your inner child comes out and then you kind of are just like in the ring and can't get out. Right. We say it's like it's like being on the dance floor. Like you're on the dance floor and you just can't get off the dance floor. But that's like anything. That's like being addicted to caffeine or sugar. Anything. Like if you take, you know, a year off yes. of caffeine, yes. you're like, I'm great, I don't need it. But then as soon as you start becoming dependent on it yep, again, you're like, it. oh, this is, you have to just know that's a problem Once for Once you're me. in it, you don't see the way out either. Like right. you ever see someone that's in a relationship that's like so clearly bad, but they don't see it? There's mm -hmm. just no doors. Yeah. It's just no doors. That's all. It's right. like, I'm in the ring with you and I just forgot that I, I, I don't know how to just walk away. It's right. like when someone's in active addiction with any kind of chemical, which is why it's taken me so long to have patience with it. Cause you're like, well, why did you stop drinking? It seems so right. obvious. 
Yeah. Because I don't get chemical dependencies. Like, I just seem so obvious to me. Like, well, if you can't, if drinking is a problem, just stop drinking. Right. It, but like, love is a chemical. Love is a, the, so you have a chemical dependency. We call it the internal drug cabinet. Yeah. So the dopamine. Ooh, I like yeah, that. I know. The internal drug cabinet. So, like, are you using? So there have been times that I've been in relationships where I'm like, oh, I'm just on drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oxytocin and fu- all these. And we talked about it. I talk about this on the podcast a lot, but like, no, if this person is a drug dealer, are you with a drug dealer or not? Yeah. And for me, a lot of my bad relationships is like, oh, you're just like a drug dealer mm. and I'm chemically dependent on you, which is part of the reason that now I don't sleep with someone. My new rule is like 12 dates about. Right. So if she sleeps with you before that, doesn't really like you no. that much. <laughs> no, no, I don't see myself getting chemically dependent on you at yeah. all. Too short. The two things I've seen you in are one that was very casual for you and possibly not for the other person. Mm-hmm. And that was hard to watch. <laughs> I felt really bad for that person. It's this. It's, I think, and the other. And then the other, uh, which is more recent, mm-hmm. which is the first time I've ever seen you impressed by literally anyone. <laughs> Literally anyone. You're like, uh-huh. oh, everyone listening is like, but she's impressed by people who come on her podcast. She's not. <laughs> the first time. And you almost fucked it up. I watched you almost fuck it up because uh-huh. you were just like, I don't know. Like you started doing all the things I do yeah. that you were just chastising me for, which is like, this person might just be using me. This person, yep. you know, is not responding in the way I want. This person mm-hmm. isn't as invested or doesn't get it or doesn't see me. Filling in the blanks. Filling in the blanks before this person even had a chance. And this person being so direct with you. Mm-hmm. And, like, I'm on FaceTime with you watching you freak out in a way I've never seen you freak out. Well, here's what you saw. Which was adorable. That I think so is fun. really important. You saw my inner child. You, ha- you yes. met my inner child. Yes. And... Um, cause you're used to unhealthy people. Like all of your feelings are so valid because mm-hmm. of what you've been surrounded by. Well, you have for to so many know years. what someone kicks up in you. Yeah. So it's like, if you know, I am my attachment strategy, which you guys know, Google it as you're listening. Like, you know, I get anxious, preoccupied mm-hmm. if someone is not anxious, preoccupied with me. So if mm-hmm. someone is anxious, preoccupied with me and needs my validation, needs my attention, I get dismissive. Yeah. A more layman's way to put it is like, if someone likes me too much, I just get, I feel secure and then I kind of get bored. Right. It's like, I, I got you, so I don't need to chase you or wonder about you. I'm, I'm not saying any of this is good. This is just the way that I'm wired. Mm-hmm. But if somebody... If I project that someone is not available, it kicks up my dad shit, which is like, I have to work for your approval. I have what to tap dad, dad, dad shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like saying daddy issues. People have to stop saying that. It's just, it's, yeah. it's too vague. It's, it's dismissive. It's pejorative. I don't like it. It's, it's really ruining the word daddy. It really <laughs> <laughs> it makes it less sexy in bed to say you've totally ruined that word. That's why no. I don't call babies babies. I call them infants. Because I want to say baby. Because you want to say baby in bed. Yeah. I mean. Babies have ruined the ability to sexualize babies. Yeah. It's like fucking stop. You, you guys like now I'm a pedophile. <laughs> Fuck. Because I just want the guy I'm fucking to be a baby. <laughs> no, I can't say that. No, I say daddy. Um. But I think it's important to just know like what comes up in you. And and I, when I get, I mean, I the word triggered. I love, Annie Letterman does this joke about um, how since we're all like just giant five-year-olds, when she says triggered, she says twiggled. Oh, the way funny. a kid would say, I know, it's just yeah, like yeah. a good, so I'm just like, I'm twiggled. Like yeah. say it like that just to remind yourself that your inner child is actually what's freaking out, not right. your adult self. Yeah. But when there is an absence of communication or what I perceive as an absence of communication, if someone like kicks up that familiarity, right? We like pattern recognition, like, oh, I know this pattern, mm-hmm. which is I don't hear from someone constantly because they're not an addict mm-hmm. and they're not smothering me and they're not constantly available. I go into inner child mode and sadness comes up. Mm-hmm. I have so I have such a fucking deep well of sadness that when someone triggers the feelings that I felt when I was a kid, yeah. whether they want it has nothing to do with them, they didn't cause it. Not their if I'm crying, it has nothing to do with you, mm-hmm. dude. Like nothing. But like you were on the phone with me, or we were Facetiming or something, and I was texting with this person, and he like 
something about like not being available the day that I thought they were going to be available. And I just started bawling, crying for like an hour. It right. just, it like twiggled a deep well of sadness yeah. that had nothing to do with them. And I, I really like to use the word unresolved. I was like, this person is helping me process some unresolved shit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, this episode, we've been talking a lot about how to improve yourself, how to not go to the problem for the solution, how to not go to your relationship or your business um, problem or family problem. Um, and we'll keep talking about it till we figure out how to stop doing it. <laughs> I'm just saying don't go to the problem for the solution. That's a big theme on this podcast. Uh, but better help is a place you can go that is a way better place to go than your problem. If I have an issue with you, Benton, I don't go to you. Which would be never. Which would never happen. I would go to BetterHelp first, talk it through with a licensed professional. And they would say, we love Benton. We don't understand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I haven't ruined our relationship by being like, I'm mad at you. They'll go, Whitney, you're fucking crazy. Benton's the best. Imagine if that was the response what? that BetterHelp gave people. I mean, any any oh. licensed professional would say give that advice. Within f under 48 hours, you can start communicating. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. So for those of you that are like, I want to get better. I've read a lot of books. Um, I want to improve my life. I want to stop these addictive behaviors. I want to stop being in bad relationships. Now is the time to like take that step. If not now, when? And the thing about BetterHelp that's really cool is that they, really cool. I like to make sure I get real specific. I know. Why? It's really awesome that they match you up with, uh, they match you up with like professionals that match your needs, which yeah. is the hardest part about finding somebody to talk to. Is you're like, I don't really vibe with that person. They yeah. don't understand what I'm talking about. They don't get what or I'm saying. Or if you're just like, I have female problems. I want a female. I yeah. want a male there. I want to talk about sex stuff. I want to talk to someone. You know, like just you should be able to choose. See, that's cool, right? The person you want. Very <laughs> so cool. Thanks for the specific adjectives, Benton. I was thinking more like helpful, salubrious, beneficial. Salubrious. A word we all use. <laughs> Better Health wants you to start living a happier life today. Therapy is a very complicated uh, thing to have to schedule and book and drive and get there. They take all of the stress out of something that should be. It's helping. on your time. Yeah, it's supposed to alleviate stress, and Better Help has figured that out. It's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Yeah, which and is, financial aid is available, which is really important. That's amazing because sometimes our biggest problems come from financial insecurity. <laughs> all of our problems come from financial insecurity. <laughs> Visit betterhelp.com slash Whitney. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P. Sometimes we talk too fast and don't say that, and you guys think it's better heap, and you're Googling better heap. What's better heap? Betterhelp.com. Join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I'm available. They close the website. <laughs> I'm absolutely available, just FYI. Special offer for good for you listeners. They get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Whitney. You <laughs> love Brooklyn. Dude, I am a plush bitch. I like the finer things in life. Getting out of the shower. Ooh, grabbing a Brooklyn and towel, wrapping it around your bosom. Listen, they are nice towels. They are, I'm just, they are fluffy and nothing... comfortable, and they wash really well, which is very important. Oh, because you I— You ever had a towel you wash, and it just shrivels up at the end? Or it, the stuff doesn't wash out of it because it's such low quality. And what I do is after I put my makeup on, I then wipe my hands with all the— foundation yes. on it onto the towels <laughs> it is a shocking experience <laughs> it looks like, like did you did you shit on these towels <laughs> is that placenta um and so everything washes out of it which is probably not something that brooklyn is <laughs> trying to lead with here and they keep their 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 like absorbency and their softness they don't become sandpaper all of a sudden feel like a princess there's just like that moment when you get out of the shower it's like in the morning you're like rushing you're like trying to get on with your day and then your towel sucks, so it hasn't wiped off all the... And then you're hot, you're cold, and then you put your 
clothes on and you're still wet and now your clothes are damp and you're just like, it's just like the worst feeling. There's nothing more annoying than a towel that doesn't actually dry off your body. And these towels work. And then walking wrapped in your towel, walking to your Brooklyn and sheets. So that guy, like the stalker that's looking through your window is like, damn, she has good taste in towels. Yeah. You're like, I can't kill her. She's luxury. <laughs> the sheets. No, I mean, who's but, more, who, who cares more about sheets than me? I don't know. <laughs> but I know that these sheets have made me like sheets. But also, I'm you, excited to wash the sheets you spend to put them back on the bed. 35% of your life in your bed. You spend more. <laughs> I spent 98% of my yeah. life in bed. I'm just saying, like, you have to, your sheets, they, when you go to bed at night, your sheets are the last thing you hit. And when you wake up in the morning, you start your day on a, the right foot. It took me 38 years to realize that the most important investment you can make are good sheets. Yeah, you want to improve your living space and impress people? Mm -hmm. Just get a nice pair of sheets. And impress yourself. Yeah. When you lay down, you shouldn't be getting, you know, like um, rug burn from your sheets. And nothing makes me feel better than walking in my bathroom and seeing that shelf of matching towels. Uh, I am like, I'm am an I adult. Martha Stewart? <laughs> what am I, the queen am of I Versailles? Am I on the cover of O Magazine this month? What's happening? <laughs> and then I go to my bed and I'm like, a puffy white comforter? <laughs> Jesus. Do I host an E! News segment? <laughs> Who am I, Drake? I must be on the real house vibes. This house is luxurious. <laughs> but that is what that is like such an important part of like building self esteem is investing in self care items and investing in the things that only you benefit from. Spending money on all sometimes. And only, trust me, only I benefit from my bed. I'm just saying only things that you see. We spend a lot of money on crap to try to impress other people. Spend money, impress yourself. See what happens. See how your life changes when you have a sexy pair of sheets in your bed. Watch how watch how your life transforms. Watch how all of a sudden nobody's good enough for you. I mean, they have it all. Brooklyn is the perfect place to find all the comforts for home, including ultra soft towels. They're so confident in their products that everything comes with a lifetime warranty. Whoa, I didn't That's even know that. Shocking. Use promo wow. code Whitney for ten percent off your first order at Brooklinen.com. That's Brooklinen, B R O O K L I N E N dot com, promo code Whitney. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. So sometimes, if you're in a relationship and it's bringing up feelings, like you can just thank them for, like, you know, helping you work through unresolved shit. So I think that's what that was. But also, like, yeah, I ever, when someone's healthy and not in constant communication with me, because they're not addicted or not obsessed or not infatuated. Mm -hmm. I feel rejected and abandoned. And it's so fucked up because we've talked about this before. Like if someone was is too smothering up top, mm -hmm. then I never trust the intimacy because I'm like, well, you're like this with everyone. You're just kind of a sex addict or like this is just my defenses. And then like it doesn't feel special. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're out of my sight, I'm just going to think you're doing this to someone else. Mm -hmm. I, I know that you're going to, if we don't hang out for the weekend, I'm like, well, it takes, it only takes him like a couple days to fucking be super close to somebody. Right. So if they move quickly you in the beginning. You hate like, dating me. I'm just saying if you move, <laughs> if the person you're with moves too quickly with you. Right. Then you're always questioning them because you're like, well, they move quickly with everybody. Right. And they're going to move quickly when I go out of town with someone else. Interesting. Like yeah. you want someone to move really slow in the beginning so that when you're together, you don't have to worry about them when you're not with each other, I think. Yeah. Even though it can be fucking painful. Right. Yeah. I mean, I feel that way. I think I feel that way more sexually, but that's probably just like old religious stuff where hmm. I'm like, they, that was something they said is like in church where they're like, if somebody has sex with you before they're married to you, they have no self-control. And you're like, what? But I think there's there's something in that 12 date thing where you do feel like a false sense of intimacy if you maybe sleep with someone you like really quickly if you're that type of person. You can't, I don't think you everyone's can't. like that, but I think we I don't. look I am for I, sure. How long do you wait to have sex with somebody? Um, if you want to date them. I usually the shortest amount of time I've waited is like a month. Mhm. Mm so, yeah, I mean That's good. I That's good. That's pretty good. I've only I've only That's had good. sex with like one person I didn't love yet and I hated it. Interesting. What I've realized recently about myself is like every relationship I've had for the most part, has been a reaction to my last relationship. Interesting. That's why you have myself. to take time off after you date. Yes. You do need to date. Uh, uh, here's my. Here's what I think. I think when you first start dating someone you like, you should start dating other people. 
Interesting. Okay, so if I, on Monday, and you have to have plans with your girlfriend. So if on Monday, right. you have a date with someone you really like, the next two nights, you should have plans with girlfriends right. that you do not fucking cancel, mm -hmm. and then a date with another person, even if you don't like them that much, to take the pressure off, right? and so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, and you're not putting everything on them, and right. then you can see them again like four days later. This whole, I, I, I'm not saying it's right. I know I loved the movie Blue Valentine. I would love to be able to meet someone and just fucking spend, play ukulele in the road. So yeah, and just yeah, fuck that's for four real. days straight. It's just not healthy. You not overdose real. on somebody. Like if you really like someone, you should not spend too much time with them the like first week that you're meeting and hanging out. This whole like, we go out on a Monday and then we hang out till three in the morning and just like talk about the universe. And then what are you doing right. tomorrow? And then you have, meet up at five and then you have dinner and then you're taking, and then the next day you have brunch and you're hanging out till it it's just you're gonna start resenting yeah. each other because you're gonna start giving things up and you're not gonna go to the gym and you're not gonna be eating well and you're not gonna be hydrating and you're not giving it a fair shot because you're overdosing you're oversaturating yourself mm. with the other person you have to tease it out move slow yeah I think that makes sense listen a lot to me sense. I'm 38 and single I know what I'm talking about she did it <laughs> Um, no, I, I don't ask you for <laughs> marriage advice. I go to Ron Funches. That's Thank you. <laughs> that's who I ask for advice. <laughs> that's the num but that is the number one mistake I see people making is they just move too fast and they can, they, right. they like, it has bad PR. Like, like they market it as like, you know, or perceive it as like passion or soulmates and all that shit. Like if you're passionate about somebody and you're a soulmate with them, like they can wait three days if oh, it's totally. so meant to be. Yeah. I will say I don't. I have never been the type of person who has, like, the bandwidth to date more than one person at a time. I just don't know how I could do that. Like You have to just to I take the... I could go on a date Just here to and take there. the pressure off that person. But I think that's just being fine on your own and being really busy and being happy with work. So there's not a lot of pressure then on that person. Then have work or friendships or something. And Absolutely. I'm, I think that's true. I'm agreeing with you. And I think that yeah. what... Um, uh, part of this uh, aforementioned coven that I'm developing of all these like girl friendships is for the first right. time in my life I'm experimenting with how to get my emotions. More experiments, you guys. <laughs> Do you hear her? This is like, this is what it's like to be friends with Whitney. Everyone's on her Instagram like, oh my God, giving me life. All these girlfriends. We're an experiment <laughs> at her house. It's just her putting us in her swimsuits, <laughs> taking photos of us to see how long it's going to take for Wait us to I become start... addicted to her. <laughs> Wait till I start mining you for your organs. <laughs> Truly. She's like, she's training us to be surrogates. <laughs> she made us do laps last time we were here. She's like, now everyone pretend they're having contractions. <laughs> it's a fun game. I just want to make you guys rich so that you can take care of me. I'm going to develop a cult and start just commissioning you. Whoever holds their breath the longest gets to come on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you're a lot. <laughs> Thank God. I, but like, you're the best, but also, oh my God. I we're mean, experimenting. Look, anyway, you're experimenting I'm with friendship. I'm just experimenting with how to get my emotional needs met mm. other ways besides relationships with men because yes. my whole life it's you have girlfriends you have work but as soon as a man comes along you brush them all to the side right and your man has to service a hundred percent of your emotional needs interesting hasn't worked out so well that's what you've been doing that's what I was sort of programmed to do. Who did men, you talk to about that guy men come first <laughs> my therapist or really? my or him I need to talk about you. To you. Yes, I would routinely go to the problem for the solution. I thought if right. you got in a fight with your man, you go to your man to deal with it. No. no you go to your girlfriends. True. You go to your program. You go uh, A 12-step program. You go to your therapist. Whatever it is, you don't go to the problem for the solution. I didn't know that. Right. I did not. You have sisters. I think you I probably have, have a healthier relationship with women than I did. I didn't have yeah. a, a healthy association with women for a really long time. Yeah. And then a lot of my friends were guys. And I thought for a while, like, oh, the best way to get advice about guys is from guys, which I still believe in a lot of ways. Um, but I also had inauthentic friendships. I had the girlfriends yeah. that wouldn't give me good advice. They would be like, I think he just likes you too much. Right. Like his phone's probably broken, like that type right. of shit. Now I have girlfriends that are like, yeah, it's not working. <laughs> you know, right. they'll tell me the truth. They're not scared of me. So I think for me, I'm in a big reorganization moment in my life. Like, you talked about losing friends earlier. We talked about this a lot on the podcast. Like, I think we have to update our software every year and make sure the same way we update our phones, 
our computers, like, is this still the best version of my friend circle? Is this still the best version of my, you know, professional circle? Like, you just have to refresh every now and then. And I think mm -hmm. that I'm going through a little bit of a sort of, I'm molting. Interesting. And trying to have more female friendships in my life, especially with equals. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. A lot of times. Then why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> It's a great You're question. failing. Um, uh, I think the stronger your relationships are with good girlfriends, the better your romantic relationships are going to be because you're not going to try to get all your needs met from that person. Hmm. Even though I think it's my instinct, at least my programming, to as soon as a man comes along, your girlfriends, see you at the wedding. Interesting. When you're my bridesmaids, see you in a year and a half. Yeah, I don't have that. I think I lean on my girlfriends a lot when I'm in a relationship. Okay. I see them less because you always see people less when you're in a relationship. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm gonna be leaning. It's I'm gonna be leaning on someone for yeah. my emotional needs. So yeah. let's divvy this up. I do though feel like sometimes you do go engage with a partner more than you should. Yes. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Going to the problem for the solution. Yes. That's something I think about a lot that you've said. And I think because yeah, I think about you sometimes, and it, and I I never would have known this at, at 26. You're so wildly ahead of me, so none of this should feel disparaging. But like. It took me so long to realize that silence is the only language men understand <laughs> and vice versa with women, men with women too. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot dignify certain things with a response. Right. And I think that because you're so smart and you're emotionally very mature that we think that if we're just more clear and direct, the other person's childhood will change. Ooh. There's it, a quote for you. It just doesn't work yeah. that way. And I think that we're at this this self-help moment with Instagram and podcasts and stuff where we're like, oh my God, I know how to express my feelings. And like, I know how to talk through things. And I'm so emotionally mature. And I'm going to mean what you say. Say what you mean. Don't say it mean. And I'm not, just because you're being clear with the person and direct and mature doesn't mean the other person has the uh, mental equipment to receive what you're saying. Right. Well, and just because somebody's aware of something doesn't mean it's going to change overnight That's in the right. same way that just because we're aware of our shit doesn't yeah. mean that we're going to handle everything perfectly. Like, think about how much we talk like, well, well and this is what it is. And it's our attachment style. And yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah. And then we meet someone we really like. That who doesn't makes make us their feel... dad have said, I love you 20 exactly. years ago. Exactly. It doesn't. Our self-awareness hasn't fixed us. Why would it fix someone else? Say it again. Our self-awareness has not fixed us. Why would it fix someone else? Yes. Uh... We fixed it. We need it. a sound effect. <laughs> it doesn't magically fix things. And I think it's taken me so long to just realize that like time takes time and knowing the solution for you doesn't fix everything. Yeah. And, you know, it's so interesting because for the men listening, I think this is important too because this is going to make you like me more. Um, I'm about to lose all my female subscribers, but it's taken me so long or I think women so long in general to like find our voice mm -hmm. and be able to stand up for ourselves and be able to set boundaries and to be able to like be strong women or whatever that means. But like now I'm saying you found your voice great. Now stop using it. Stop talking so much. <laughs> just stop. Like half of what you just like cut everything you want to say in half and then cut it in half again. <laughs> like it just, just right. don't say it. You can't take back. You can't take it back. Yeah. Once you've said it. And the more you say, the more shame you're going to feel later that it didn't work. Yeah. And that is what erodes your self-esteem and your self-worth. Right. Is I just said all this stuff and it didn't work. Now I'm embarrassed. Now I failed. Yeah. So, do you know what I'm saying? Right. So, I wasn't enough. Like, that's what I've learned in the last year in relationships is like someone else's actions don't have anything to do with me or my – They do, not that they don't have anything to do with me, but they don't have anything to do with my worthiness, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? And I think I always thought like, oh, if I were prettier or if I were better or if they liked me more, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have treated me that way. Mm -hmm. And that's not true at all because And maybe – by the way, and maybe they would have treated you better and that would have been even worse. <laughs> If you were prettier and they treated you better because of that, that would have been even worse. Right. But they wouldn't have. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like, it's not that they were like, be careful what you want. You might get it. Right. It's not like people are sitting there going like, I I've just met, I have so many like hot, cool, successful girlfriends who dudes just like, who dudes just like mistreat yeah. or like don't treat correctly or can't get out of their own way to yeah. be with. And you're like, 
Oh, like because they're attracting shallow guys because they're hot. No, no. Some of them are good dudes and they just are like, why couldn't he have done this one thing for me? Like I have an ex who I'm like still best friends with and our only issue in our relationship is that like his work ethic wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I can't like get past this. He was unattractive and like he's acknowledged it now. He's got like a great job now and he's really like, you know, he was like driving for Uber and I was just like, dude, I can't like do this I'm outgrowing this and now he's in a totally different place and we're like very good friends and so he had a car okay (laughs) you're like already sound already a cat like a cat in the industry (laughs) um but over black that was literally our only thing and like I remember I said jokingly like a couple years afterward like well I guess you were never gonna get it together for me and he was like it had nothing to do with you Mm -hmm. like these are the reasons I finally got it together and it wasn't the girl I was with next and it wasn't because I didn't want to be with you forever like Mm -hmm. it was just my own thing it was never going to happen at that time Mm -hmm. it was just bad timing and you never want someone to do something for you you want them to do it for them it won't stick it won't stick and they will resent you and now you're their mom and now it's incest yes exactly Exactly. So that that's been very freeing for me because I don't have to take everything so personally anymore. Mm-hmm. It can just be something that, you know, doesn't serve me where I just go, OK, that's something that isn't going to work for me yeah. in a relationship. Yeah. And it's not anything necessarily that makes them a bad person or me not hot enough yeah yeah it just is what it is and it's where you're at and it's where i'm at yeah and that's not compatible and that's fine yeah so like taking all i mean this is what mood stabilizers will do for you guys (laughs) (laughs) the difference in me after getting on mood stabilizers which is what is crazy what's it called uh i'm on lamictal okay I think it's a mood stabilizer. Oh. I tried to get on antidepressant. What's a mood stabilizer? I don't know. How That's is that different than antidepressant? Me. I mean, I was told. A and mood again, stabilizer. I know. It's, I mean, I mean, I'm mean, i also taking an antipsychotic that they're like, you can also use this to sleep, like as needed to sleep. Uh-huh. And I'm like, is this a mood, trap? A mood stabilizer. That's, I mean, it's, but don't we want different moods? I mean... I mean, you just don't want to be so like this. I don't like up and okay. down. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, uh, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate okay. a little bit because right. I'm not, I'm not a. I know this might come as a shock to you, but I'm not a doctor. Yeah, do you I see know. A, I'm. Just do you a, see a psychiatrist? I'm surprised as you are. I have a psychiatrist that I see once every like three months because right. I went on Prozac. Yeah. Yes, because okay. I've been in. Um, uh, cognitive therapy and Al-Anon 12-step programs, I always want to qualify this by saying not all therapy is good. Just because you're in therapy yes. doesn't mean you're sane. Right. Sometimes therapy makes people worse. Right. Some, some therapists are bad at their some job. Some therapists are bad at their job and they just yeah. want to keep you there. Uh, right. And they just... Uh, or they're know. men. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> I've been to therapists that I, I felt... You're just trying to keep me sick so that you keep me here. They weren't offering solutions like EMDR, 12-step programs. Right. Like if you have addictive behaviors and no one is recommending 12-step programs, get the fuck away from that therapist. Right. Um, a lot of times talking about something too much re-embeds the trauma Ooh. and strengthens a false narrative. Interesting. And it's not healthy. I mean, the reason I love my therapist is that she'll, she takes a very neurological approach. She'll go, you need to stop talking about this for 30 days. Wow. You need to stop apologizing for 30 days. Like, you're not allowed to complain for 30 days. Like, she really wants to retrain my neural pathways. She's like, you need to do this workbook. You need to write this. You know, it's like, it's actually about getting better. She's yeah. like, my goal is for you to stop seeing me. Right. <laughs> if you're still seeing me in five years, I'm bad at my job. Right. You know, that's her sort of thing. So I think it's important to just, and also, when I first went into therapy, it made me worse, for lack of a better word, um, if I may be so inelegant, because... I became arrogant because I was like, and I thought I was better than everyone because I'd be like, well, I'm in therapy, so I must be right. Yeah. Well, I'm the one that's in therapy. Right. You know, I'm in therapy, so I feel like right. you should, I'm, you know, it made me uh, arrogant. I go to therapy and I'm like, am I a narcissist? And they're like, no, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I, narcissists would never ask if they're narcissists. Right. And that's what they said. My yeah. therapist was like, you're fine. And also I talked to your psychiatrist and she doesn't think you are either. <laughs> like they've like. I've asked that too. Have, have I asked my therapist. I said, do you think I'm a psychopath? Do you think I'm a sociopath? And do you think I'm a narcissist? I've done this many times. Right. Uh, and she's like, and do you think I have borderline personality disorder? Oh, I did that too. Yeah. yeah. And she would, and she's just like. People with borderline personality disorder don't come to therapy and ask if they have it. Yeah. 
yeah. they number one wouldn't be in this room because they any criticism right. to them feels like an attack. It's too much for them to right. handle. And narcissists don't acknowledge that they have weaknesses, so they wouldn't be like, "Do you think I have a problem?" Right? They'd be like, "I'm the best. I don't need to go to therapy." They wouldn't be in the therapy. Right. Exactly. You know, but just because someone's in therapy doesn't mean they're healthy <laughs> mentally. <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> and therapy doesn't work for everybody. Depending. Look at us. Bangs, pink hair. We're a fucking mess. <laughs> Dude, um, I do think it's important. Like, I do think moods are important. Like, well, yeah. I think it's taken me so long to realize that, like, happiness, serenity, whatever that means, doesn't mean an absence of negative feelings. It doesn't mean things that hurt shouldn't hurt. Things that hurt should hurt. Yes, but you like, should be sad sometimes. That's an appropriate. Like a lot of people yeah. with the pandemic, they're like, "I have anxiety." It's like you should. It's That's not a, a numbing reaction. agent. It's Good. a mood stabilizer. I just there's a difference between like I'm really sad. I'm crying today, and I'm disassociating, and I feel like I'm in a dream, and yeah. I don't know what's happening, and yeah. I'm panicking, and I don't feel real, and I'm scared I'm gonna hurt myself. Like there's a huge difference yeah, between of those course, two places. Of course. And now I'm in the former. Which nice, is great. <laughs> Which is now you're like, the feelings I'm feeling are appropriate. Yes, exactly. Like, I still feel everything. This was something my friend told me when I was like, I don't know if I can get on antidepressants. She was like, honestly, like, I was like, do you just feel good all the time now? And she goes, no, I still get really sad. I still panic. I still feel anxious. She's like, but I don't feel like I'm not going to get through it now. She's like, now I feel like I can handle it. Nice. She's like, but I still feel all those things. It's, I think that it's like people, antidepressants and these medications, it's like, are your reactions appropriate? Yes. Like, does the punishment fit the crime? Right. It's that. It's yes. like, if you, if I spill this off the counter and start hysterically screaming and crying, there's yes. something going on. If I spill it and go, ah, oh, fuck, that's a healthy reaction. Yeah. If, if someone dies and you're sad, you're not depressed. Right. You should be. There's this, like, a little bit of a, a war on anxiety and sadness that I think is often conflated with actual clinical depression. Like right. we all feel entitled to be happy all the time. And that's not, that is not how our brains should work. Right. Before you decide to go on medication or therapy or whatever, first make sure that you're not surrounded by shitheads. Uh-huh. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I spent a long time being like, I'm such a mess. And it was like, no, right. my friends are just assholes. Right. That are late and selfish yeah. and make me feel bad about myself and that right. that are th- sort of make me um, question my self-worth. Like, f- make sure you're surrounding yourself with dope people before right. you diagnose yourself as the problem. If right. you're surrounded by dope people and you still feel anxiety and stress and now, okay, this is a me problem. Right. Before you solve a problem, first make sure it's your problem. Right. You know what else hmm. I, I realized about our relationship? Uh-huh. One of the reasons you probably feel close to me and one of the reasons you have done so much for me is because when we met, you didn't feel like, and you're right about this, that I wanted anything from you. And in fact, was very anxious about giving you any indication that I wanted anything from you, even like just your time. Uh huh. And I've felt that way about people who, whatever, open for me or, or whatever, like yeah. people that I do the most for uh-huh. are people who have never made me feel like they wanted anything from me yeah. except like to get to know me or whatever. I have an interesting take on that. And and I think it's helpful for people to know this, which is that if you're hiring, when you're a boss, when you're trying to figure out who should be in your life, uh, professionally, personally, I think it's very important to see someone's, it's going to sound like an insult. Just I said something hold, nice and you're going to ruin it. Just hold for it. I right. think it's very important to see someone's like flaws right away. Mm. If you leave an exchange with someone and you're like, well, that person just has it all together. And like I see no, that that's what's alarming to me. Uh. Like um, I like to see everything up front because I like to I don't like to feel like I've been played or like I'm acting or like I'm mm. engaging with someone's false self or mask. Interesting. It makes me feel unsafe and uncomfortable. Like if you come in and you're like, hey, I don't really like you that much, uh, like, or something shitty. I'm like, at least I know what I'm dealing with. I don't care what you are as long as it's honest. Right. I can handle any, I can handle anyone's authentic self, but I can't handle someone's um, false self. That's interesting. Because I feel like you can be friends with people you don't fully trust in a way that I can't. Interesting. But I accept their flaw. I, I go, this person's not trustworthy. I don't tell them this and this and this. I radically accept their nature. Wow. And then I decide whether or not I, I'm i the idiot if I confide in someone who I know isn't trustworthy. I know that this person's codependent. So it's like there are people in my life that are like girlfriends or something. And I know they're unrecovered codependents. Interesting. I know 
that they will tell one of my secrets to someone else in a fucking heartbeat. Right. Because they're insecure and they want to trauma bomb with that person or they need to snitch or they have some shame addiction. Or, or they just might think it's fine to talk to me. Yeah. You've told people stuff about me that I told you that not I had to, to tell? be like, yeah, that I had to be like, can we not talk about that in front of people? But, you, but, you're but I didn't know. Did but I not you, know? But you should have known, I feel like. You should have known. That is the crux of her in a relationship. Like That's you with every guy. You should have known what I was thinking. You should have known not to share it with me. I, now I do. <laughs> I learned that. I learned that. I said, so okay, I if I tell you that. So I shared information about so you. Other people are going to know that. Yeah. On social media? <laughs> I just, I, I mean, didn't yes, share it. I no. just posted it. You told, you told people something that had happened to me recently that I, that they knew the day they met me and they were like, oh, so this happened. And I was like, okay. I took five days to tell Whitney that happened. Oh. And I was like, okay. My, pro- yeah, I, I take sometimes. I don't want to lie. I lied for so long mm-hmm. about so much, and I kept so many people's secrets for so. But it wasn't a it, secret. I, I know this yeah. is mine. Mm-hmm. This is totally my fault. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry. It's okay. That's the thing, though. We have the type of relationship where I can go, "Hey, can we not do that?" And yeah. you're like, "My bad. Got should've, it. Should have known that." Totally. Yeah. Which is I fucked up. Yeah. Um, which I also feel like I would do. So yes. I feel like we have that, which I. Makes me and sense. also the fact that you can come to me and say, "Can you not do that?" That's fucking huge. Yes. Yes. Not that it should have come to that, but still. But yeah. And you were, you know, it was one of those things where like, we're in this business where everybody's kind of just telling everybody everything all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're I all I think that's every place. business. I think that's right, everyone's yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that I also, it's tricky because I do still struggle with the, I, I'm not good at lying. I'm just rusty. Like I right. used to be so good at it because I used to lie so much. Now right. I'm just like. I'm just bad at it right. and people will know. Right. But I also think it's really important to develop the skill to be able to say, you know what? It's it's inappropriate for me to chime in on that. Right. Or when people are gossiping about someone to go just, I don't know enough about the situation to weigh in yeah. or I don't have an opinion on that or like it's none of my business and I just, I don't, I'm not judging you guys for talking about it, but I just truly, yeah. I just don't want to say anything. Like right. learning that you can say that uh-huh. And that just because other people want information doesn't mean you have to give it to them. It's taken me a yes. long time to go like me not participating in gossip doesn't mean I'm a bitch. I just, you know, it's just not appropriate for me to share. Totally. And I've completely done that with people where I just like say things mm. before I realize like or I just assume people already know things yeah. or they're going to know something. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter if I say yeah. this. And then you go, ah, shit, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Like, it's so I'm just so easy afraid of lying. Do. I'm I'm like, I think I'm. Too af- so afraid of lying that but I overshare. nobody else is. That I we overshare. We are like that. We I both know. overshare because we're afraid of not being authentic. Yeah. Nobody else is worried like, about that. Like, I'll go, I'll <laughs> like be talking to the guy that the I'm dating and I'll be like, just so you know, I dated this doctor when Same. I was in Philly. And he's like, what? Like, I don't, right. I, like, I, I just so like. Yeah. Like, uh, omissions are not lies. Right. Lies and omissions are not the same thing. Unless somebody says, I need to know something for this reason. I think it's in a book called Attached. Um, The book called Attached by the Science of Attachment, Anxious Avoidant. Mm, I don't think it's this one, but there's something called the couple bubble that has really served me in relationships, successful relationships, where it's like, it's called the couple bubble, which is like before we go into a party, you get into the couple bubble. It's like, okay, what are you insecure about? What am I insecure about? And you approach going to a party or a public space or a wedding or whatever, yeah. like a like a team that's about to go out and you make a play, which is like, okay, Lindsay's going to be there. She makes me super insecure. So if Lindsay corners me, can you make sure to come help me? And you approach it like... um like a team Mm -hmm. and like, oh, Mark's going to be there. And, you know, I dated Mark and I don't care. But like, I just like if I'm around him, I'm probably gonna want to hold your hand. So can you just like put your arm around me so that we're not going into situations expecting the other person to read our mind and know what we need. We communicate what we need before we go in and we're in the couple bubble. And also I want to leave by 10 o'clock. So we're on the same page about Mm -hmm. when we're going to leave, about how much we're going to drink. Okay, let's have two glasses of wine and then let's go to, you know, whatever, fucking Carl's Jr. afterwards. Like, and you have a plan. So later you're not like, well, I wanted to fucking leave it. I was ready to leave and you weren't ready to leave and you had three glasses of wine and I had one glass of wine. So you were fucking wasted and having a blast and I was fucking miserable stuck in the corner with Lindsay. Right. You know, so you have to like, like create a game plan. And that to me is like the most important tool in a relationship 
Yes. Because after every party, after every wedding, it's a fight. What the fuck was yeah. that? You just fucking talked to John the whole time? I was right. fucking alone in the corner with the guy I fucking dated two years ago. Like, it was just like... I just want a teammate. I just want someone on my it. team. That's it. That's it. That's all. That's it. As soon as you're on separate teams, you're fucked. Yeah. That's why it's hard to date people who are very self-focused yeah. or selfish. Even if they're, like, really good people. If yeah. they're just, like, in their own movie the whole time. Yeah. And everyone is just a character. And even if you're, like, their leading lady... You're still just a character, in and it's their movie. also if you're arguing with someone or having a uh, uh, what I like to call a, a growth opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> a, nice rebrand. A pivoting session. <laughs> <laughs> if you're having when, when I post a picture of me and my boyfriend on Instagram, I call it a marketing meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's a branding experiment. <sighs> um, no, I, I do like to call fights or arguments opportunities for growth i love that it's better that's really hey great. i think there's an opportunity for growth here should we talk about this yeah you know yeah uh calling it fights arguments like it's just bad uh it's just bad words yes that makes things seem worse than they are and make your motives ooky um but if there's an opportunity for growth with someone that you're dating um I think as soon as it's like I'm fighting with you instead of I'm fighting for you, it's over. Yeah. It's like if I win, we both lose. If I win, that means we're against each other. Right. So I think it's taken me so long to realize like, hey, buddy, like I felt really insecure about this thing. I needed to bring it to you. I wanted to talk to you about it. It has to be more like a, uh, I'm not a sports person. A, what is it when you get a doo-wop? What's it when you – a hand pow? When you get together with a bunch of people and you do a, a – Pow wow. Oh, there it's you more go. of a pow wow. Okay. So, Huddle up. <laughs> this is appropriation. It's like, what are we doing? I know, a pow wow. <laughs> it's a pow wow. It's not a fight, it's not an argument. Like, it's a pow wow. Like, yeah. It's like, hey, dude, like, if you approach conflicts with, with your partner like that, it's going to be so much better. Right. Because yeah. then no one can fail, because no one can win or lose. That's if you so, win, you yeah. feel like shit, and if you lose, you feel like shit. But that's the benefit of oversharing in, in the beginning of a relationship. If you overshare and you go, this is what I need, uh -huh. this is why I need it, yeah. really clear about it mm -hmm. before it's even an issue, mm -hmm. you don't have to read my mind, mm -hmm. and then that's like just blown past or ignored, that's like hard to get past, I think. Yeah, and I don't know why you guys wouldn't believe all of this coming from two single women. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, both of us could have been married if we wanted to be. <laughs> no, I have. It's it's honestly. That's the thing. I just have a very, I'm holding out for a hero. And I'm 26, so it's fine. <laughs> and I'm 67, as you all. <laughs> I've been in a relationship uh, for the last seven years. Are you dating now or no? No, not Why for not? a while. I don't want to. Good. That's I've what, had but multiple are, people invite me to Raya. I'm good. But are you actively saying I'm not dating now mm -hmm. to for certain reasons? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. You're taking a, a sabbatical. I am taking a sabbatical. I love that. On everything. For how long? You have to put a date on it. Um, I don't know. I mean, at least until January. You should, like, put a hard date on it. Then you're but, gonna then go, you, but you can't decide. You can't gonna, be like, yes, you can. by this date, I'm going to be over my ex-boyfriend. No, like, no, no, you no, can't no. do no, that. I would just put a, if you put a clock on it, say, like, I'm not going to date anyone until January 1st. Okay. Just, or whatever. Yeah. Because then I really love scheduling decisions. You can always add later. You right. can always add months later. I'm not even going to think about this but as you, an option. But you might cave yeah. sooner. You might go, well, I met this guy and it's been two months. So I might, you're going to. And that yes. is what erodes our self-esteem. When we have yeah. a plan and don't follow through with it and then we feel weak. So the best thing we can do is set goals and then achieve them. And mm -hmm. that builds our self-esteem. So it's yeah. like even if a cute guy texts you, it's like, Text me January 2nd. See yep. you then. And the same thing with making decisions where it's like, and you and I went through this a lot when we were scheduling our tour. Hot segue. Um, <laughs> where we were talking about Reno and San Francisco, <laughs> November 6th and 7th. <laughs> we were talking about um, COVID and, and touring. And we were like oscillating on whether we should tour, whether we shouldn't tour. And I remember us going like, let's not think about this till, uh, till June 8th. Right. Until then, so that we can free up and liberate our brains to think about other things. And then we can stress schedule when you're going to stress out about something. Yep. Instead of generalized stress all the time, mm -hmm. just go like in relationships, like right now dating somebody, not sure about it. I'm going to, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this till November 1st. Right. Till November 1st, I'm going to entertain this. I'm going to be in it. 
because my instinct, I'm very black and white because mm-hmm. I need a, even a false sense of control. I'll go like, fuck it, I'm out. And the next day I'm like, oh, he texted me. He's kind of cute. I was being ridiculous yesterday. Right. And then I'm just in madness. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm going to just be in until November 1st and then I'll decide. I'll make a decision based on the data I've collected until November 1st. Yes. Because right now I just don't have enough data. Yeah. Not yeah. enough data, which I think is just like a, a good thing I'm learning when people are like, I don't know if this guy's good for me or bad for me. I'm like, you just don't have enough data. Yeah. It's premature. Yeah. I think that's great. You also told me something recently where you were like, you're 26. You don't want to meet your person right now because no. you're not who you are. And I was you're like, gonna you're going to meet your soulmate and then you're going to be a different person in two years. I know. I know. But and I think it's possible to grow with certain people. And I think a lot of it's timing. And like, I haven't been alone in a really long time. Yeah. And part of it, I think, is just childhood insecurity of like, yeah. you're afraid to lose momentum. You're like, if I stop dating, maybe I won't know how or I won't be desirable anymore or something and I finally feel like I'm in a place where I feel good about myself which is really weird yeah and I'm like okay like right after I came into your life I what a coincidence I Whitney came into my life broke me down again (laughs) and I built myself back up and I said wow I trust me Uh, I was like you're not religious anymore you can just call me God (laughs) you can call me God now Jesus has risen I'm here (laughs) Are you there, Whitney? It's me, Taylor. You told me to come at two and your front door is locked. I'm texting you. Um, Yeah, I just, and I think anytime I've been working on myself, which is, this is so sad, I was working on myself to be better for somebody. Ooh, I, was, I was like, oh, if fuck, I just dude, fix I, this. I can't believe you just said that. I, I cried last night. I cried, yeah, uh, hard. Why didn't you FaceTime me? I needed to do it because... Uh, you know I, I want to watch you cry. That's a really good... I should have. I know. I, I, I do go back and forth with you of how much weakness I want to show you. Please um, show me more. That would be great. But um, I... Yeah, no, I feel a little bit of pressure around you to be, like, strong a lot. To be like, this. everything you're doing is working. You're, uh, this, oh, no, I you know, know it's not. Like, yeah. I, I see your flaws like you see my flaws. I think we wow. both see each other. Wow. What would you think, uh, for someone listening, would they find surprising that you know about me? Ooh, surprising that like, they know about you. What's a surprising you? thing that you didn't expect? Oh, that you can be very toxic while dating <laughs> someone. While dating you, someone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can be super toxic, and you seem like somebody who but would I, just but, be really like, no, I'm going to take a step away. But here's the good what? news. I don't bring it to them. I hide it from them now, and I go through it on my own. Five okay, years yeah. ago, I would have taken my toxicity to them. Interesting. Now I take it to my girlfriends right. and let them okay. help me through it. Yeah. And then they would never know about it. Right. Unless they listen to this podcast, which is a nightmare. Right. It's hide it. You have to just protect them from your... But I've seen you play games. I've seen it happen. And games you, and you told different. me, you're like, you have to do this. You just have to yes. play this game. And I'm like... Mm, I don't think it's you do. this. It's this. There's a difference between playing games and acquiescing to human nature. So when I say like you can't respond to that text, let him spin out a little bit. I'm not saying play games. It's just don't do his work for him. He's uh-huh. doing something immature. Let but him. He, the time you're talking about where you're like, I'm gonna let him spin out. He was being so mature with you. He was being so direct, so mature. And you decided it wasn't what you wanted to hear. And so you were like, he fucked up. He fucked up. I'm going for a walk. He fucked up. And I'm like, I don't think he did. But then I needed to take a walk and I needed to process. the. I did, thank God I didn't respond. Right. With something emotional or, punish, or punitive. Or, you did. You did respond. And I said. Something kind of petty. Oh. And confusing. And then he <laughs> tried to call you. And you were like, mm. And I was don't like. Respond. Talk to this person. Yeah, I was, I, but you cannot engage if you're in an emotional if place. If you were in an emotional place, I made a mistake you were, then. Yeah. You were in an emotional place, but yes, you did work through it on your own. Yes. You're correct. But I just wouldn't have expected any of that. Yeah, because from this you. is someone that kicked up by inner child. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But then you've seen me with someone that is super available. That's the most available relatable thing about, oh, yeah. And then you with someone who's super available to you is so sad. <laughs> <laughs> so bad for that guy. It's like such a nice dude. All right, we have to go because we're taking COVID tests. Because in order yeah. to fly to, uh, uh, take our flight we have to I, I didn't know about this you have to we have to present our COVID test um, I think in order to like work when we're I think it's just precau- is it just Boston is it just uh, Massachusetts um, I think technically it's New York too they make you sign oh. something when you land that says Uh-oh. you have to quarantine for two weeks um we're not or doing that. Unless you, well, that's because we're proving that we took a COVID <gasps> test. Oh, okay. So I guess this is the way around that. So we'll show up with a piece of paper that's interesting. Yeah. I haven't done it, so I huh. don't know. But um, I'm trying to look at all of the things that I didn't ask you that I Oh, wanted. yeah. I'm so curious. Do you want to just we hear even the go list? To this? I have a yeah, list. Yeah, I would love to hear the list. 
oh, this is what it is. I was, because after I was, my crying spell last night, uh, I was trying to think about what it was and I realized that when I like somebody, I get really emotional and sad. Yeah. Because it's ultimately, like you have to figure out why you're in pain and what the pain's coming from. It's my, ultimately goes down to my fear of being embarrassed. Yes. Ooh, when you, yes. When you like someone, it's embarrassing. Humiliating. Embarrassment is the most terrifying thing to me. Right. And I, I, you might not even get this reference because you're too young, but the movie Carrie. I've seen Carrie. Oh, really? Yeah. I always feel like, a, not, not not the Carrie Underwood documentary. Oh, shit. The movie no, Carrie. No, Carrie. <laughs> where um, at the end she gets, wins prom queen, yeah. and then the they played a prank on her and the blood goes on her head. Oh, that's what it is. I'm not waiting for the other shoe I to drop. Feel... I'm waiting for the pig's blood Ooh, to drop. Ooh, that's it. Yep. The embarrassment. And so for me, when I text a guy, this is why I'm so careful when I text, because I know... And we've talked about this. If you're going to send a text, play out the rest. Are you going to be waiting for the response? Are you going to? That's part of the reason I'm so stingy with my communication to someone I like because I know I try to like plan. Okay, I'm going to text him at eight because then I have nothing to do afterwards, and I'm not going to be waiting for a response. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like I try to pr like protect my future self mm -hmm. <laughs> and being careful when to try to avoid feeling embarrassed because right. if I don't hear back or something embarrassment comes up um which is a very deep primal fear of like being embarrassed maligned castigated and ultimately in your reptilian brain like you don't have the protection of the tribe I mean right. it's like a very deep fear right it's like cellular yeah like it's like it like anyway yeah that was um, a question for me that was something that I <laughs> So you're embarrassed right now. Tell us right, about it. Uh -huh. I just figured you'd I'm be good. embarrassed. I feel great. <laughs> yeah. Just wearing that shirt. I I'm just, too mean. You're pretty mean. I love that you can take it. You can handle it. Yeah, because I don't respect you <laughs> anymore. It was actually when we were pitching this TV show, the first, there we'd had like five pitches or something, and I would like make fun of Taylor. I'd make fun of Taylor the whole time. And, like, roast. and then say how great Brandon was the whole time. <laughs> by the last, by the last pitch, she goes, okay, so this is Whitney's thing. This is literally like we're on with the head of Hulu and it's so clear that we like have some like resentments to work out. And she's like, all right, this is Whitney's thing. She'll like roast me and then say how great I am. Yeah. Like, it, like, it was like, they were like. And then she talks about how toxic it is to be partnered with older people in Hollywood as if that's not what I'm a victim of right now with her. <laughs> It was so like like someone walking in and like you know when you're at like uh, somewhere and a couple is fighting and it's like so yeah. awkward for everybody else. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. But Everyone, I think they enjoyed it. Everyone's like mommy and daddy's fighting. No, because I also think it's just so important that uh, they see that you stand up to me. Yes. That's what. Oh, there's that's no what it point was. in have. There's no point in having your voice on the show if I, I'm not hearing. Right. It, if it's not clear you know, if you're if you're just scared of me they're gonna be like well is taylor's voice really getting in the show or is whitney steamrolling her true and i used to be scared of you and i'm not anymore literally yeah you had no questions for me wow you literally had nothing <laughs> no i did I, I don't think you did you just talked about you crying for another 10 <laughs> minutes and my question was why didn't you call me well my big question is uh what's going on with your hobbies my hobbies i don't think you have enough hobbies I don't. I really don't. You don't have any non-work related hobbies and it's worrying me. That's true. Um, Your hobbies are like taking COVID okay, tests. Okay, says the woman who literally films everything for Instagram stories. I'm sorry. It's called Bidneth. <laughs> I rescue dogs. That's true, you do. And I rehabilitate horses. I mean, this is like from a huge intervention for my yeah. therapist was like, you need to do two hours a week. I'm sorry, four hours a week. Twice a week for two hours a week, non-related work hobbies that's just play. Right. I see my sisters and my friends. That's good. Like but not that, about getting yeah. smarter, not about getting better. Because to me, I'll turn any hobby into a job. Right. I'll be like, I'm going to read a book for my hobby. And then it has to be like... Yeah, I have a self-help podcast. A science podcast. book where I'm getting smart. Yeah, where I was like, we're reading all these self-help books. Let's just do a podcast. Like, I literally... Yeah, but that's not, that's not just for fun. What do you do just that's for fun? That's what I'm saying. I don't... What's your fun? 
I don't know. I've just been watching TikTok lately, but I wrote a that's bit work. about it. That's work. So. Yeah, that's it true. Work. That's work. It's me watching it going, that's okay, work. how do I get better at this? Oh. What are other people doing? I don't have anything. I oh, know. God. I don't have anything. I was there. I was there. I mean, I remember and I was like, I'm going to like sew blankets and like do crochet and I'm start doing crochet and I'm like, I should sell these on Etsy. Like, right. I can't just do something for fun and for free. Right. So Your horse is for, for fun, fun and for free. Yeah. I mean, Even yeah. rescuing is a job though, so I wouldn't give you that. I don't, it's not a job. I don't get, I lose money rescuing animals okay all right so but I, I do I, post about it because it helps them but it's not my business I don't I, mean you're making money like I not lose a work way. off of rescuing animals everyone thinks I'm crazy but you're doing a it is work what you're doing it's hard what you're doing I it's know but like so you do is that rock climbing rock climbing is still a hobby even though it's hard okay that's true all right I'll give it to you all right all right fair so you're so right about everything that was my <laughs> I take it back thank you're you right. okay clip that that's right gonna be the clip just her on a loop no but like so do you have any suggestions for me for hobbies? Because now I have time. That's another reason I nice. need to be. But you will be a better artist more. if you I have know. hobbies. I know. I think a lot I think a lot of the kind of high performers and the kind of people that listen to podcasts like this and the people that are trying to hustle, 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 in order for art to imitate life, you have to have a life. If you guys have any suggestions for hobbies, please send them. Please. I did want to kind of start uh, gardening. Yeah, uh, you could. Yeah. That I would, would be do good. gardening and like growing shit. Is I love fun that for me. You. I love that for me. I'm too poor. Um, okay, we love you guys. Is there anything else you want to say? Um, this was fun. This was fun. Was this good? Yeah, I feel like this I was feel good. This is. I feel like if I if this podcast existed when I was 22, I would have be married by now. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like if I didn't know you, I would listen to this podcast. Like this is a banger. Yeah, I listened to some episodes of this, but I have to have like not seen you that way. But this is like a, 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 a this is like a wisdom dump. This one, oh yeah, we got this into is a, it. This is a wisdom dump. And I don't think we overshared too badly. Mm. Are you gonna, I mean, you can go back and edit. Cutting all, everything I set out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's definitely a, uh, this was definitely a banger. Yeah. This is definitely good. like a share, a share it. I mean, we'll see what the numbers are. Yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> I will see who we'll got see what, more views than me on YouTube. What the data is. Look, well, I'm Hillary more... Duff is killing it. Oh, there. I'm sure she is. Killing in the oh, numbers. She's so good. Um, all right. We love you guys. Uh, see you on tour. San Francisco and Reno and whatever other dates I force uh, Taylor to add. Love you. Don't write elephants or dolphins. Um, and write Taylor some positive comments about her shirt. And don't, don't, yeah. don't tell her I'm bullying her. Don't, don't enable her. I know. Don't do that. You don't need to tell me. I have to pee so bad. <laughs> me too. Hi, baby girl.